Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this special webinar on the Western drought and fire conditions. My name is Viva DeHaza, and I am the Executive Director of NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System, also known as NIDAS. NIDAS was established by Congress in 2006 by a public law and was congressionally reauthorized twice with strong bipartisan support in 2014 and 2019. NIDIS's mission is to develop and provide a national drought early warning system, coordinate and integrate federal research in support of a drought early warning system, and build upon existing forecasting and assessment programs and partnerships. I would like to thank everyone who worked to put this webinar together, including our partners at the U.S. Department of the Interior and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. First, allow me to cover some basic housekeeping items. On this webinar, everyone is muted and the webinar is being recorded. The webinar recording will be available on NIDIS's YouTube channel and linked from the webinars page at drought.gov. Please check the chat box periodically throughout the webinar for links to some resources mentioned in this webinar. We will have time on the agenda to take a few, a few of your questions here shortly. For questions, please use the questions box, which is located within the GoToWebinar control panel, and indicate your name, your first name, affiliation, and then um, your question as you would like to have it read. The 2021 Western Drought Webinar has assembled stakeholders, decision makers, and drought experts from around the West and around the country. This is an informational webinar on drought and fire conditions and current response efforts across the Western United States. The webinar will include a summary of past, current, and forecast drought conditions. We will also learn about potential and ongoing impacts from drought across communities and sectors, and federal agency leaders will speak to federal government response and relief efforts and resources. We intend for this information to be useful, timely, and actionable in supporting communities and sectors impacted by the ongoing drought. I am honored today to be able to introduce our distinguished opening speakers who will help us kick off this webinar. We will first hear from Dr. Rick Spinrad. Dr. Spinrad is the recently appointed NOAA Administrator. Dr. Spinrad could not be here in person today, but we are grateful that he has recorded his remarks and we are excited to welcome him back to NOAA. Then we will hear from Tanya Trujillo, Assistant Secretary for Water and Science at the U.S. Department of the Interior. And finally, we will hear from Gloria Montano Green, Deputy Undersecretary for Farm Production and Conservation in the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And now, NOAA Administrator, Dr. Rick Spinrad. Viva, thank you for your kind introduction and the opportunity to speak today regarding drought conditions across the Western United States. First off, I'd like to share some personal perspectives on this topic. I may work for NOAA in Washington, DC, but my family and I are currently living in Oregon and we're experiencing the drought and its impacts as we speak. I know firsthand the profound impact drought has on communities and all sectors of the economy. Much of the West was drought free just 14 months ago, but today more than 89% of the West is in drought with over 56% in extreme or exceptional drought. How did we get here? What does the future hold? I know these and other questions are on the minds of many Americans and will be the focus of today's webinar. As the nation's provider of authoritative weather and climate forecasts, NOAA plays a vital role in protecting livelihoods and ecosystems in times of drought. Droughts take a significant toll on communities in ways unique from other extreme weather events. According to NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information, droughts cost the U.S. an average of $6.3 billion annually. 
Drought can also exacerbate the conditions that lead to wildland fires, which in turn cause multi-billion dollar losses themselves. In fact, wildfire impacts totaled $16.5 billion in 2020 alone. Here in Oregon, there's a wildfire the size of Los Angeles burning right now. And this is only the start of the wildfire season out west. According to the 2018 National Climate Assessment, high temperatures are project projected to worsen the intensity, duration, and frequency of drought over the coming decades in the western U.S. This was exemplified last month when the worst heat wave in the Pacific Northwest's modern records impacted the region, smashing records over an incredibly hot four-day period. NOAA science plays a critical role in informing the nation about extreme heat, including our National Weather Service heat outlooks and forecast tools used to convey heat intensity and heat stress and to heat safety campaigns. Our leadership on drought issues is demonstrated by the National Integrated Drought Information System, or NIDIS. I was at NOAA during the initial development of NIDIS in the mid-2000s. NIDIS, as authorized by public law, provides an interagency mandate to coordinate and integrate drought research, building upon existing federal, tribal, state, and local networks to create a national drought early warning system. While led by NOAA, NIDIS would not have been successful without the ongoing partnership and leadership of the Western states, the federal family, and local and tribal communities. I've seen firsthand how NIDIS works with our sister agencies to produce effective tools and resources demonstrating that NOAA can do even more to partner in the future as the trusted agency for climate and weather products and services that are agnostic to the missions of those that benefit from them. For years, NIDIS has supported state leaders to prepare for drought, wildfire, and water supply deficits by communicating those conditions, forecasts, impacts, and escalating risks in the region with consistent coordinated information delivery. Across the West, we're partnering with the National Drought Resilience Partnership and its supporting capabilities, such as the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Climate Hubs, the U.S. Geological Survey's Climate Science Adaptation Centers, and our state and university-based partners, including the regional climate centers, regional integrated sciences and assessments teams, and others. Through these partnerships, we provide regular drought updates to thousands of stakeholders, host monthly or bi-monthly webinars, for the public and the media on conditions, outlooks, and decision-making tools. And we convene regular interagency meetings to ensure that response efforts are guided by the best available drought data, research, and information. For decades, NOAA has operated many of the observing systems that inform our understanding of drought, particularly space-based platforms that allow for spatially complete observations and estimation of soil moisture, vegetation condition, and fire danger. Ground-based observations from NOAA's National Mesonet Program, automated surface observing systems, cooperative observer network, and others help to ground truth and calibrate the satellite data. NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information maintains the official historical climate record that's used to compute and define drought for the past more than 100 years. This information and improved predictions developed by NOAA's research and our academic partners help communities proactively plan and develop resilient infrastructure, such as electrical grids and water distribution systems, restore ecosystems, and ensure the viability of our coastal and marine resources now and into the future. Across the West, communities and sectors of our economy that depend on water, from agriculture to energy to recreation and tourism, rely on NOAA's information for vital decision making to reduce drought-related losses and impacts, and to make their lives and livelihoods more resilient to future drought risks. No one entity or agency can do this alone. We stand with our Western communities and our federal family as we, together, face this current drought and are working closely with our partners to provide the best science, products, and services possible to meet these challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spenrad. I will now welcome the Assistant Secretary, Tanya Trujillo, to make her remarks. 
Thank you, Viva, and uh, greetings to everyone who's participating in the webinar. I'm very pleased to be here. My name is Tanya Trujillo, the Assistant Secretary for Water and Science from the Department of the Interior. It is very uh, wonderful to be able to co-present this conference today with our colleagues at NOAA and the Commerce Department and at the Department of Agriculture. We have been working along uh, agency lines and working together with our federal agency partners to be responsive to the drought conditions that we are seeing around the country. But we are also working very closely with the non-federal partners and the communities that are impacted by the drought conditions this year. We are looking forward to hearing the presentation today and participating in additional remarks at the end of the program. Uh, in addition to Dr. Spinrad's comments about his location, I am also located in the West here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where we have had some amount of recent precipitation, but uh, it really is uh, on top of dry conditions and severe drought that is affecting much of the West. So I share uh, the concerns that many of you have uh, the various locations around the country that are listening in today. So thank you all very much for participating. We look forward to sharing information, not only during this presentation and this conference webinar today, but also throughout the rest of the summer and into the years that come. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Trujillo. That was great. Uh, now we will hear from Deputy Undersecretary Gloria Montano Green. Good morning and good afternoon, since we're across the country. My name is Gloria Montaño Green. I'm the Deputy Undersecretary for Farm Production and Conservation over the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and at the moment I'm in DC, but typically I'm usually based out of the Phoenix area in Arizona. So very familiar uh, for the last few decades on the uh, ongoing drought and what we've been moving. Uh, for me, it's a great uh, honor to be able to bring some personal experience, similar to Dr. Spinrad and uh, Assistant Secretary Trujillo, uh, to be able to have um, not just a belief in moving policy and engagement and how are we able to find flexibilities and to support, but also to be using our personal experience and how we're living within our communities that are most impacted by drought and bringing that to Washington, D.C. policy and helping local tribal state um, communities. Over at Farm Production, um, at Department of Agriculture, there are many areas of where we interact with drought, be it in research, be it in short-term relief for our producers or some long-term planning um, and watershed development um, and work. We also have the forest, um, services, forest Service in collaboration with the Department of Interior looking at um, paying attention to the drought impacts of water quantity and what that means for uh, forest health and forest fire. It's an ongoing conversation, um, a regular update. Um, daily of being able, how do we think about uh, not just addressing the, the issue at hand, but how are we thinking about long-term policy? So I'm really excited about today's conversation and future conversations to be able to think about the most um, experts in the room, uh, what we can learn from, where we need to be thinking about greater opportunities and where we need to um, find more flexibilities in our program to, to look at drought resilience um, and supporting communities most impacted. Um, so I just wanted to share that um, Assistant Secretary Trujillo um, with Department of Interior and Department of Agriculture, we are co-chairs of two um, areas focusing on drought work. One is the White House Interagency Working Group uh, for Drought Working Group, uh, which is to look at some immediate relief and solutions that we can be thinking about. And then also co-chairing the National Drought Resiliency Project, the NDRP, which Dr. Spinrad mentioned, uh, which um, NOAA was uh, with the creation of it. And so that is looking at some of the medium and long-term work that needs to be continuously worked on drought. And that has a collaboration of data, research, action and coordination across the government um, amongst many other things. So just thank you for today's time. And um, I don't know, Assistant Secretary Trujillo, did you have some comments out on those two? But it's a, it's a great coordination and it already has showed some 
um, great results on how we're approaching communities in need. That's absolutely correct. Thank you to all of the folks uh, at NOAA and NIDIS in particular who helped to organize this particular webinar. And uh, it has been a wonderful experience just working with the folks at USDA on some events so far this summer. We're looking forward to being out there in the communities and, and trying to see what types of programs we may be able to build together with you as we uh, as we move through the rest of the summer. So thank you again for what, to, what is to come for this program and look forward to continuing to be working with you in the future. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us today and providing a very important context for the balance of our webinar today. Um, the first panel in today's webinar will be focused on drought conditions and forecasts and the seasonal fire outlook and will be structured as follows. We will first hear from Dr. David Simmeral from the Desert Research Institute and Western Regional Climate Center, followed by Mr. John Gottschalk from the Climate Prediction Center at NOAA's National Weather Service. Following Dave and John, there will be a few minutes for questions for the speakers. Please feel free to again, type your complete question into the questions box, exactly as you would like it to be read. Um, we will all we will not have time to answer all of our questions, but we'll select a few and read them for the panelists to answer. Following the short question period, we will then hear from Kelsey Satellino from NIDIS and Dr. Nick Nosler from the Department of the Interior's Bureau of Land Management. And then following Kelsey and Nick, we will have another opportunity to ask questions. I'm grateful to be able to introduce our invited experts. I would first like to welcome Dr. David Simmeral and Mr. John Gottschalk. David Simmeral is an associate research climatologist at the Desert Research Institute and Western Regional Climate Center in Reno, Nevada. David has been at the Desert Research Institute since 2003 and has been an author for the US Drought Monitor since 2012. Mr. John Gottschalk is the Chief of the Operational Prediction Branch at the Climate Prediction Center within NOAA's National Weather Service, where he is responsible for a suite of subseasonal to seasonal climate outlook and monitoring products. Prior to his current role, Mr. Gottschalk served as Climate Prediction Center's Head of Forecast Operations. Mr. Gottschalk holds a Bachelor's of Science and Master's of Science degrees in meteorology from Pennsylvania State University. Dr. Simra, please, um, please uh, go ahead and start your presentation. Okay, thanks Viva. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, all right, let me get started. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, first I'm gonna start out talking about the uh, current drought conditions. Um, if you take a look in the upper right hand corner, just for reference, um, those are the uh, drought early warning system regions I'll be referring to on the left hand side. Uh, overall, um, as mentioned earlier, the Western US is uh, currently at about 90% in drought uh, with 57% in uh, ex extreme to exceptional drought. Uh, this week marked a, a milestone in that uh, this is the highest percent area of uh, drought in the western United States uh, since the drought monitor started in 2000. Uh, that just happened uh, as of the release of the map just, uh, just last week. And you can see the breakdowns of the individual dues regions, how much is in drought, um, California, Nevada, 100%, uh, Intermountain West, 82%. We've seen some improvement, which I'll talk about uh, later in the presentation. Uh, Pacific Northwest, uh, 92%, and Missouri River Basin, 59%. Uh, there's also some folks going to talk about impacts, but generally speaking, we're seeing impacts around the West in the agricultural sector. We're seeing economic, ecosystem related, uh, water resource, uh, stream flows, elevated fire danger, and recreation. Next slide, please. 
so I can't get into all the development because of, of the drought because the the drought developed differently in different parts of the western United States but I'm going to give you my take on uh, what uh, how I feel this developed in the West and this dates back as mentioned about 14 months ago uh, when most of the West was drought free in the spring of uh, 2020 and you can see that on the drought monitor map with the April 7th uh, 2020 you can see there was some uh, lingering drought in the four corner states as well as some uh, kind of longer term uh, precip deficits in Northern California and areas like the Klamath Basin. Uh, the drought ramped up quite quickly in the uh, summer of 2020 uh, due to a really poor monsoon season in the uh, southwestern United States, United States and it was uh, the driest June through September on record in the Four Corner states. Uh, the record-breaking heat, which started in uh, late, late July last summer, um, exacerbated the drought conditions. Uh, moving into the winter months and the cool season, uh, a combination of snow drought and anomalously warm conditions at various periods throughout the winter, as well as a big warm-up in the springtime, uh, led to poor runoff across the uh, uh, drainages in the western United States and expansion, expansion and in intensification of drought in California as well as the Great Basin. And in other parts of the west, in the Missouri River Basin, uh, conditions started to deteriorate uh, more so in the late spring and into the summer months. And of course, the record breaking heat we've experienced. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, which really ramped things up in that area. On the bottom right, you can see that's a time series map or a time series graph of uh, the percentage area in drought uh, for the Western United States. I've highlighted a couple areas. On the right, you can see uh, currently where we are. And basically, we've got about 90% of the Western US, as mentioned before, in drought and about 56% in extreme to exceptional drought. Uh, we were at a next highest level was back in uh, September of 2003, and we've now surpassed that. Next slide, please. Uh, this is looking at change maps for the US drought monitor. Um, I've picked out uh, a couple time frames that I think that are significant. On the left, those are the one-year time changes. And what these represent are the warmer colors, the yellows and browns represent degradation. The darker the color, uh, the more classes of degradation on the US drought monitor map, where the cooler colors are improvements. Uh, and you can see in the areas of, uh, in Arizona and uh, the Southern Sierra and the Mojave Desert, uh, those areas had five category uh, degradations over the past year. They were drought free um, in that last map that I showed you for spring of 2020. Uh, but you can see across the West, uh, just deterioration, uh, a lot of deterioration in conditions uh, with a rapid uh, degradation. Uh, one positive area would be Looking at eastern portions of uh, Colorado as well as New Mexico, we've had some uh, good springtime and summer precip, which I'll talk more about later. And then on the right-hand side, uh, you can see I've highlighted a couple areas where we've seen degradation in the last three months. Uh, in California, uh, those degradations have been in response to uh, poor runoff from back-to-back. Uh, -back. Uh, poor winters in uh, in the Sierra Nevada and other ranges in California, and we've seen degradation in the Pacific Northwest as well as Missouri River Basin uh, in recent months uh, due to uh, above normal temperatures and below normal precipitation in some areas. Next slide, please. So looking at uh, kind of big picture where this current situation, which developed uh, just over a year ago, um, this sits within the broader context of uh, essentially two decades of drought in the Western United States. 
uh, where we've had average temperatures that have been consistently above normal and uh, below normal precipitation uh, during the 2000s with some intermittent wet years. And those are illustrated on the two uh, plots on the left-hand side. Uh, these are for the West region, and this is looking at the 12-month periods of uh, July through June. And this is uh, the period of record from 1895 to 2021. Temperature on the top, precip on the bottom. And each of these uh, asterisks on the uh, chart represents precipitation for that 12-month period. The red line is kind of like an on uh, a running nine-year average, and the purple line is the the average. So if you look at uh, the areas uh, that, that I have in the box, um, you can see that ramp up in average temperatures. It's, it's been above normal since uh, basically the 1990s, and it's been consistently above normal as compared to the uh, period of record here we're looking at. In terms of precipitation, you can see uh, the plots kind of all over the place, and that's typical of the temporal variability and spatial variability of precipitation in the West. Uh, but you can see starting at about uh, 2000, and in some areas in the late 90s, uh, basically, we've seen uh, many years of below normal precipitation. If you count the individual years on here, there's about uh, six 12-month periods that had above normal precipitation and uh, 14 with below normal. Uh, and on the right-hand side, this is just another measure of, uh, of drought, and this is the Palmer Index. And it shows you on the top are dry years, and on the bottom are wet years. And you can see on the upper right-hand corner, um, basically this is the percent area of the Western US that's in drought according to the Palmer Index. And this is essentially almost 100%. So that sets a record in the 122 year record of the percentage area in drought. And then below you can see the wet years um, as compared to uh, previous years and uh, lots of dry conditions. Next slide, please. So I've picked a couple time frames to kind of illustrate and take a look at uh, how we got to where we are now. This is uh, temperature and precipitation. These are uh, two maps of the statewide uh, ranks for average uh, temperature as well as precipitation. And, uh, Basically, the, what we've seen is persistent anomalous uh, heat and dryness over the past 12 months. Uh, it was the second driest and fourth warmest July uh, through June 12-month period on record for the Western region. And uh, at the state level, you can see on the uh, right-hand side, we had the driest, uh, the driest 12-month period, July through June period uh, for uh, Arizona, California, Nevada, and Utah. And then on the left, you can see um, we're pretty close to record warmth uh, for that period for uh, a number of the states across the Western US. And I also, uh, up in the upper right-hand corner, um, I basically, this is looking at the, the individual river basins, uh, precipitation ranks for that period as well. And uh, you can see that the lower Colorado River Basin, as well as the California River Basin, uh, these are very uh, uh, broad uh, boundaries for these, but uh, those had the, the driest on record. Next slide, please. And these are just a, a couple more uh, quick slides over the uh, past 12-month period. On the left, that's percentage of normal precipitation. Uh, the red and brown warmer colors are below normal, and you can really see um, kind of uh, down in the Arizona, Southern Nevada, Southern California, um, just all the dryness across the Western US uh, for the past 12-month uh, period. And then these are just on the right-hand side, uh, just to give you an idea of what kind of uh, departures from normal for this period you're seeing in areas like Northern California, uh, looking at 16 to 20 inch uh, precip deficits, 
um, as well as uh, other areas like the Wasatch uh, with 12 to 16 inch deficits. Next slide, please. Looking at the last three months, uh, We've seen considerable degradation uh, in drought conditions during this period. Uh, we've seen drought the normal conditions, as you can see on the uh, upper left-hand map. Uh, these are the mean temperature percentile, percentile rankings, uh, or percentiles, excuse me, for the April through June period. And this is generally when our, uh, our runoff from the mountain snowpack is occurring. And you can see all the record warmth um, across California and parts of the Great Basin, um, as well as parts of Arizona and Utah. And then on the right are the uh, precipitation percentiles. And again, uh, you can see uh, areas of uh, dryness, uh, near record or record dryness uh, across California and areas of Utah and the Pacific Northwest, um, as well as some areas of improvement in uh, Eastern Colorado and New Mexico. Uh, the, the map down at the bottom is a uh, soil moisture anomaly map, and I took a period, uh, this is for the week of uh, May 3rd, and basically this is a time of year when soil moisture uh, should be pretty high coming out of the winter, and uh, you can see all the dry soil um, across the western United States, and this uh, dryness um, as well as the below normal precipitation, as well as the excessive heat that started last summer, continued into the fall and started up again uh, during the spring months has led to uh, pretty significant soil moisture deficits and uh, reduced runoff. Next slide, please. Let's take a look at the uh, snow water equivalent on April 1st, and this is generally, this is an important date, this is generally when uh, the SWE levels are at their maximum. Um, on the left-hand side, this is looking at the various basins at the subregion level uh, for 2021 under La Nina conditions, and on the right, uh, 2020 under uh, neutral conditions. Uh, Looking at 2021, this is a pretty typical pattern for precipitation during uh, a La Nina uh, type of pattern. And you can see that in the upper left-hand corner. This is just kind of a generalized uh, depiction of what kind of temperatures uh, above or below normal, as well as precipitation above or below normal we see in uh, North America. And you know, it kind of, it's basically following that pattern. Uh, the Pacific Northwest was uh, above normal across many of the basins, uh, while areas further to the south were below normal. Um, and it's quite a gradient in getting drier as we move further south. Uh, looking at 2020, uh, it was a little bit wetter and uh, areas of uh, Utah and Colorado and Wyoming uh, had uh, better snowpack during those years. Um, unfortunately, both years we had this uh, rapid melt out of the snowpack that occurred uh, both in 2020 in the springtime as well as in 2021. Next slide, please. And this is just to illustrate uh, some of that rapid melt out. And what I've done here is uh, on the left-hand side, this is a uh, observing station at South Lake Tahoe Airport at 6,300 feet. On the right is uh, a snow tell station, and these are the, uh, the snow measurement stations, observing stations that are all across the west. They give us a picture of how much snowpack and uh, the water contents in the snowpack. As you can see on the left side, this is basically looking um, at the water year starting in October. And on the top, we're looking at precipitate or at temperature. And the red box I have around there is showing areas where we went above normal in terms of temperature. The normal range of temperatures would be in the green area. Uh, the red would be areas that are above normal. And if it goes to the very tip of the red, we're at kind of record, uh, record levels of temperature. So you can see that warm-up began in uh, you know, kind of the late March timeframe. 
and we had intermittent uh, you know, periods of anomalous warmth during that period. So looking at what that did to the snowpack, um, if you look at this, this is basically a time series, same thing, looking on the uh, on the uh, x-axis on the bottom, we're looking at the dates starting in October, and the black line represents the 2021 snowpack as it's evolving uh, through the winter months. And uh, some of the other lines on there, there's uh, 2020, that's the snowpack from uh, that year. Uh, the minimum is the lowest uh, on record, and you can see the max, and I picked another warm, or a uh, another wet year, which is in 2017, just to show the difference. But you can see uh, the median uh, point at which the snowpack is essentially melted out is generally June 8th um, at this particular site. And you can see in the past two years, uh, it's melted out quite early, especially here in 2021, it melted out by May of, uh, early May of this year. Next slide, please. <laughs> Uh, Dave, this is Viva. You have two minutes. Okay, I'm going to go fast here. So same uh, kind of story uh, in the Missouri River Basin. You can see on the left side, those are the aerial extent of snow water content in the Missouri Basin. You can see snowpack was low throughout the winter. Um, on the right side, those are soil moisture anomalies and dry soils throughout the winter. Next slide, please. And then looking at June's uh, uh, temperature precipitation, again, we had the record warmth in the Pacific Northwest with uh, record dryness, or uh, record dryness in some areas like in the Dakotas. Uh, but the big story was the record-breaking heat um, across the West, and uh, that really amplified the drought situation. Next slide, please. And then these are just looking at uh, the past uh, about a month period. And these are just uh, uh, basically locations, observing stations that set daily high maximum temperature records or all time uh, for the whole period of record uh, maximum temperature records. And you can see there were 385 all time high maximum temperatures uh, broken, uh, as well as just some examples we've all heard about. Uh, Death Valley hitting 130, which was the highest temperature in uh, the United States on record, and it tied uh, that uh, record that was uh, set last summer, and then the anomalous heat in Portland and Seattle, you could see. Next slide. And we'll just keep, keep next slide, please. I can get through the rest of the presentation. My apologies. Uh, looking at uh, monsoon season, we've had a good start to the monsoon season. Uh, we've seen some short-term improvements in the area. Uh, on the right side, in the upper right, that's percentage of average precipitation uh, since June 15th. And you can see pockets of well above normal precipitation um, across uh, Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, in the bottom left, those are some short-term dryness uh, uh, drought indicators that we use to measure flash drought. And basically what you can see are the blue areas are areas that are showing wetter than normal conditions. So we are starting to see some improvements, some modest improvements in the Southwest, uh, mainly in terms of you know help, helping out the ecosystem in terms of uh, rangeland conditions, uh, forest health and so forth, and uh, some boost to the uh, stream flows in the areas as well. Next slide, please. And again, stream flows uh, across the west are kind of uh, mirroring the uh, soil moisture conditions. Uh, on the left are the June averages, uh, the, the red and maroon colored stations are all in the bottom uh, fifth percentile or lower. The real red ones are record lows. So you can see all across uh, Northern California, uh, the Cascades, as well as across Utah, Western Colorado, and so forth. Uh, looking at the real time conditions, again, uh, the record heat uh, and dryness has really got 
uh, conditions, uh, stream flow conditions have really tanked across those areas. And in the southwest, we're seeing uh, some of those stream flows uh, get back to normal range. Next slide, please. And just to finish up looking at reservoir conditions, um, on the right, uh, this is uh, basically statewide reservoir storage as of July 1st. And uh, a lot of, not a lot of good news uh, in terms of reservoir storage, as uh, most of us have heard in the news. Uh, lately, a couple of the states are at normal levels, Arizona and Montana. Uh, the rest of the Western US uh, has below normal. Uh, overall, uh, again, reservoir storage is well below normal uh, across the West. And we've, most of us have heard uh, uh, two largest reservoirs in the Western US are in really poor shape right now. Uh, Lake Mead's currently at 35% full and Lake Powell 33% full. Uh, U.S. Bureau of Reclamation uh, is going to start releasing uh, water from Flaming Gorge as well as Blue Mesa and uh, Navajo Lake as well to bolster levels at Lake Powell to help preserve the ability to generate power at Glen Canyon Dam. In California as well, uh, we're well below normal on the two largest reservoirs uh, in California. Uh, also looking at New Mexico, uh, their largest reservoir, Elephant Butte, is 7% uh, full. And uh, in the Missouri River Basin, they're expecting uh, runoff to start to decline rapidly. Next slide. And that's all. Thanks much, and my apologies for going slightly over time. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, an incredible amount of information in uh, in a relatively short period of time. Um, let's go ahead and turn it over to Mr. John Gottschalk. John, are you ready? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. Uh, hopefully, you can see me. Um, the uh, yes. as I've even mentioned, um, I'm the uh, branch chief uh, of the Operational Prediction Branch, the Client Prediction Center with NOAA. I'll be giving a, a, an update. Uh, moving forward on, on our outlooks for temperature, precipitation, and drought, and, and a little further out with respect to uh, ENSO uh, during the next several months ahead as well. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so starting with the month of August, uh, both these, uh, the temperature outlook for the mean temperatures, 30-day mean temperatures for August are shown on the left, and the um, monthly forecast for precipitation uh, amounts total amounts for the month of August are shown there on the right. The, the warm shades indicate areas in which we're favoring um, monthly mean temperatures in the above uh, normal category, and in this case, the upper third of the historical range. Um, blue shades, of course, cooler than normal. And for precipitation, the beige uh, shades indicate um, favored uh, conditions for um, the lower third of, for below normal precipitation in the sense of precipitation totals, as I mentioned, and opposite, of course, for the green shades. And there, the probabilities are shown in the legends on the bottom right of each plot. And so it's important to note, though, some of the darker shades, uh, for example, on the left hand plot, um, don't necessarily mean um, absolute amounts uh, being higher um, than, say, the lower, the, the, the less uh, dark shades, um, just that the probabilities of being in that upper third of the historical range are, are more likely. So, with that in, being the case, uh, for the month of August, uh, we're favoring above normal temperatures for the minute, pretty much the entire western U.S., uh, ex expanding eastward into the northern plains. The highest odds are in that darker shaded area, which uh, range from 60 to 70 percent to being in the upper, above normal category from the northern, from the central Great Basin and Rockies up into the uh, northern Rockies and northern high plains. For precipitation on the right, um, which is typically more difficult to predict um, in general, um, we're favoring, again, as I mentioned, below normal precipitation in the beige areas in the northern Rockies and also across parts of the northern plains. Um, you can see these probabilities are a little bit lower, less, a little bit less confidence uh, in, in, in the precipitation outlook. For parts of the southwest and the remaining areas, which are highlighted in white, those are labeled equal chances, uh, which in the forecast guidance tools that we are looking at um, generally and, and also historical accuracy or, or forecast skill. Um, tend to make that a very difficult forecast 
uh, with a little bit lower reliability. So those are equal chances representing the probability for any of those three categories is basically the same or climatology of 33%. And the reason that that's the case is that the active period we see now in July, we expect that to continue into um, through most of the remainder of July and especially into early August. And so at that, from that point on, as, as you'll see in the next slide, there's a little more uncertainty whether that um, more robust monsoon will continue throughout the whole remainder of the monsoon season. So that mixture of potentially a wetter start in August and uncertainty later on in August is why that forecast across the Southwest is uh, equal chances currently. Uh, next slide, please. So for the um, August, September, October period, now this, uh, again, these are seasonal mean temperatures. So the three month mean temperatures on the left and precipitation amounts um, on the right. Again, favoring above normal temperatures for most of the uh, lower uh, continuous US and also for Alaska, with the highest odds again centered right in the interior west. Um, with respect to precipitation, uh, we are favoring uh, below normal uh, precipitation from the Central Rockies and Central Great Basin as indicated there on the right. So we do tend to feel like there'll be a tendency overall for the whole season from August through September, I mean, August through October, sorry, that'll be on the negative side. But as you can see, again, these probabilities are quite modest shift towards the dry end. Uh, and this also will include the month of October, which is outside of the main, uh, the monsoon season. Next slide, please. Uh, and how, with respect to the latest drought outlook, which is, was released in uh, last week as well, through the end of October, um, if we take a look on the uh, plot here on the left, um, the, the four different categories, uh, drought persistence is the brown, drought development uh, that is likely is the yellow, and whether the drought improves a category or two or is removed is, is, is the gray and the, the green areas. And so with the um, robust start to the monsoon and just the general climatological uh, rains, uh, even if it's a near normal monsoon or even slightly below, there should be some improvement in some of these areas as uh, Dave has already shown. Uh, and so some of those areas in Arizona that are gray and also some of the areas that are green uh, in New Mexico and Texas favor some improvement or removal of drought conditions in those areas. So that's why that forecast was made. However, the above normal temperatures uh, in August favored and also for August, September and October um, will likely persist drought conditions uh, through much of the West as indicated, of course, by the brown, but also further development is likely, unfortunately, across parts of interior Washington, Montana, Colorado, and the uh, north central high plains as shown by the yellow into northeast Colorado. Uh, next slide, please. Now, as we move forward um, beyond the August, September, October period, um, we, as was highlighted by um, Dave earlier, that um, we currently are in enso neutral condition. Um, what's shown there on the, on the left is the early July uh, official forecast from CPC and the in the IRI for the probabilities for each phase of uh, ENSO. Um, the gray bars indicate ENSO neutral conditions, the blue La Nina conditions, and red uh, El Nino conditions. And so right now, although we are in ENSO neutral conditions currently, um, we are uh, under a, a La Nina watch uh, associated with the ENSO alert uh, system. Status. And the reason that that is, is we, uh, whether it be observational information or model forecast data, we see a tendency for an increase in the likelihood for La Nina to develop in the ocean and eventually uh, into the atmosphere uh, from a coupling process as we get later into the autumn months and into the winter. Um, and so neutral is favored through the summer, but as we get into the fall, um, there's the potential for La Nina to reemerge um, again during the late uh, fall and then through the winter of 2021 into 22, uh, with the highest odds, as you can see with the, with the blue bar, um, during the NDJ season, November, December, January, the season is on the X axis. And you can see there's uh, about two times the probability or uh, about two times the probability of La Nina conditions as compared to climatology with very low odds for El Nino conditions. And so the reason that this is important, if you go to the uh, next slide, with respect to what impacts that could have look, moving forward, just depending on how the monsoon turns out across the southwest and rainfall in general across the overall west. Going into another um, La Nina state potentially, again, that's not a certainty, that's just favored at the current time and we'll have to see how things evolve. 
But an example of La Nina, of course, is the cooler than normal sea surface temperatures along the equatorial Pacific, as shown there on the left-hand plot. And as Dave showed also, um, the similar schematic is that it results in changes in tropical rainfall uh, and circulation across the Pacific uh, North America um, region. And so it elevates and reduces odds of various extreme events or general conditions because the, the altered background state is somewhat slightly different. And so with respect to some of those changes that you see there on the upper right, this is important because generally during La Nina conditions, as was uh, offered earlier, uh, drier than normal conditions are typically favored for parts of, of California and the Southwest um, for precipitation wise, where there is a above normal uh, likelihood or enhanced likelihood for above normal precipitation areas in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, also, as well as below normal temperatures from the Pacific Northwest eastward to the Northern Plains. During La Nina, um, however, there is typically quite uh, variable with respect to the precipitation changes along the, like the West Coast and the Western U.S. Uh, events, um, La Nina events uh, vary quite a bit sometimes with respect to um, the eventual precipitation signal um, along much of across much of the West Coast and the Western U.S. in general. So there's still quite uncertainty involved in this, not only with the eventual evolution of La Nina, whether that reemerges, but also in the impact, uh, real world impact across the West. If you go to the next slide, please. To summarize, um, unfortunately, above normal temperatures are most likely for the Western U.S. and the Northern Plains for both August and the seasonal period between August, September, and October. Um, below normal precipitation uh, is modestly favored for the August, September, October period overall. However, some improvement in drought conditions may occur for parts of the Southwest due to uh, prospects for an, and the ongoing active monsoon that's going on now in July and the prospects that that may continue uh, through the uh, remainder of July into early August. And also due, due to normal climatology of the, of the monsoon is at least on a normal or average basis over the whole season. Um, moving forward beyond that, uh, La Nina may potentially reemerge, as I mentioned. There's still some uncertainty in that, but that's currently a, a substantial possibility right now uh, during the autumn months of 2021, and that may continue through the winter. Uh, so its typical impact should be considered um, moving forward, uh, especially later on in the, in, as we move forward in 2021. Um, if those likelihoods continue to remain um, up for La Nina conditions later this fall and winter. So folks should start to uh, think about that potentially in the future. I appreciate your time and I'll, I'll turn it back to, to Viva. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, both excellent presentations. Um, okay, we, we have a few minutes. Um, we can take a couple of questions, um, but before I do, I just wanted to call everyone's attention to the fact that we are um, posting some additional resource links in the chat box, so check those out. And also that there was a handout that was attached to this webinar. It's a four-pager, um, a Western drought status update um, that I uh, encourage folks to, to download and take a look at. It's another example of the types of um, information mechanisms that NIDIS uses to, uh, to get information out to decision makers. So with that, uh, let me go ahead and take a couple of questions. I'm actually going to um, to call you back, John, for this first question. Um, one question that came in for you, John, was if you could explain why the um, why the temperature outlook has a curve that avoids Texas and some of the Southern Plains states. Well, I mean, in, in that particular case, um, I didn't go into all of the different forecasts. Um, guidance product products that we have in, in, in looking at that area uh, one of the reasons is most of the information that we had and we use a number of things um, soil moisture for example the existing conditions um, that we have across much of the west um, are quite obviously extremely uh, dry and so there's a tip typically the um, uh, the uh, energy is able to efficiently heat the atmosphere much more with drier conditions when there's no water in the soil. So there's a feedback there. So one re that's one reason why temperatures are so uh, probabilities for above normal temperatures are indicated across much of the West. There has been some improvement in these soil moisture conditions further east, as was mentioned by Dave in New Mexico and also parts of Texas. And there has also been quite a bit of rainfall um, during the last several months along the Gulf Coast, parts of Texas and into the lower Mississippi Valley. 
so there, that, that feedback is not there necessarily in those areas. That, that's one factor. But also some of the um, short-term um, short climate model uh, uh, guidance that we use, similar to weather forecast models that for the shorter range, we have those as well. And almost unanimous agreement from those of not having that warmer signal extend further east. It was more focused out west and that there was more uncertainty across the lower Mississippi Valley, Texas, and so on. And that's why that little arc there is, is, is in the forecast and why equal chances is indicated. Great, thanks, John. Um, next question is for Dave. Um, Dave, you had um, presented a slide, I believe the title was Drought in the West, Big Picture. Um, conditions today seem to resemble pre-Dust Bowl conditions. Is that true? Yeah, there there were several other marked periods uh, within that period of record, uh, the observational record, and uh, the difference between this period and kind of the Dust Bowl era uh, is that this has been uh, more a prolonged period of, of drought uh, that's occurred uh, than did back in that uh, that area. So we're looking at nearly two decades. Um, so that would be the, the primary difference in terms of the kind of the time scale. Thanks, John. Um, and I want to just say thank you again to everybody who posted questions. Uh, apologies, we, 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 we need to move on. We're just a little bit behind schedule. So thank you again, John and Dave, for your excellent presentations. Now I'm going to turn attention to our next two speakers. Um, the first one is Kelsey Satellino. Kelsey is the Digital Communications Coordinator for NIDIS, where she provides content, design, and planning support for the U.S. Drought Portal, also known as Drought.gov. Before joining NIDIS, Kelsey helped guide digital marketing strategy and website user experience at Boston Market and provided communications support as a contractor for several U.S. Department of Energy program offices. Following Kelsey, we have Dr. Nick Nosler, who is with the Predict Predictive Service, who is a Predictive Services Meteorologist at the National Interagency Fire Center for the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, Dr. Nosler has a PhD in Atmospheric Sciences and Meteorology from the University of Nevada, Reno. He is joining us today from Boise, Idaho. So with that, I will pass it over to Kelsey for her presentation and remember that we will hold questions until the end of these two presentations. Kelsey. Thank you, Viva. Uh, I'm Kelsey Satellino, and I'm with NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System, or NIDIS. As was mentioned a little bit earlier on this webinar, NIDIS is a multi-agency partnership that was authorized by Congress in 2006 to coordinate and integrate drought research building upon existing federal, tribal, state, and local partnerships to create a national drought early warning system. One of the key ways that NIDIS supports its mission is through drought.gov, the U.S. government drought portal, which is a key interagency resource for actionable drought information. I'm going to share my screen with you all and take you through a brief demo of the new U.S. drought portal, which you should be able to see now. In January yes. of this year, NIDIS worked with a team at NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information in Asheville to launch a completely redesigned drought.gov. The new website is a one-stop shop for interactive maps, data, and drought decision support information, showcasing the work of our partners all in one place. Over the next few minutes, I want to show you some of the key features of this interagency drought portal and how it can be a useful resource for decision makers across the U.S. The first new feature of this website that I want to highlight for you is the ability to view drought information down to the city and county level, either by visiting the by location section of drought.gov or directly on the home page. Users can enter their city, zip code, or county and click to view a location page that shows up to date drought information for that specific location. These pages display interactive maps, graphs, and statistics from a variety of our partners including current conditions information, drought blends, maps showing the impacts of drought on agriculture, water supply conditions, and public health, as well as drought outlooks and forecasts, and historical drought information 
down to the county level. And I'm gonna speak more about our historical drought information in just a moment. Uh, this is just a quick look at one of our count, county pages on drought.gov. And this is just one geographic scale at which you can view drought information. If you look at our by location section, we've tried to make it really easy to view up to date, reliable drought information from the city and county level to the state, watershed, national and international levels. The next key feature of drought.gov that I wanna highlight for you are the interactive data and maps that make it easy to visualize and share drought information. In the data and map section of drought.gov, you can browse data maps and tools by topic, such as current conditions, wildfire, water supply, and more. I wanna take a quick look at our historical information section as an example. One of the most common questions we get asked at NIDIS is how does this drought compare to previous droughts in my region? And we built this interactive time series graph and map to help better answer that question. In this tool, we have three historical drought data sets displayed side by side. The US Drought Monitor with data going back to the year 2000, a nine month standardized precipitation index with data going back to 1895, and paleoclimate data, which blends tree ring reconstructions with instrumental data to estimate the average drought conditions each summer going back to the year zero for some regions of the US. It's easy to select a data set to enter a time period to view that section of the time series graph in more detail. And then you can move this cursor along to select a specific time period to update on the map. For example, we're looking at estimated drought conditions in the summer of 1150 right now, which is in a time period that was notable for extensive and persistent aridity over the Western North America. Once you found what you're looking for, you can click on a state to view that state's drought information and the time series and map and statistics will update automatically. You can dig down to the county level for historical drought information for all three of these data sets. We've also recently added the ability to create a more customized area to view historical drought information. In this bar below the map, you can click to combine multiple states or multiple counties into a custom region and view a map statistics and time series graph for that region. Once you've found what you're looking for, you can easily download a screenshot of the map or the panel with the links below. And these links are below most of the maps on drought.gov for easy sharing. Learn more about the three historical data sets and download the data for yourself. Or click the share slash embed button at the top right hand corner of this tool to share a permalink to this resource. The third and final feature of the new drought.gov that I wanna highlight for you is really important which is that drought.gov is and has been an interagency resource, showcasing the work of our partners across the federal government, as well as state, regional, local, academic, and private sector organizations. One way we've displayed this is through our partners page, which you can find in the about section of drought.gov. This page displays our federal partners. Uh, you can see all these logos from participating federal agency partners. And by clicking on any of these logos on this page or elsewhere on drought.gov, you'll be taken to a partner page for that partner. For example, if I were to look at the partner page for the US Geological Survey, I'd see a link to the USGS website, as well as all of the data, maps, and tools from the US Geological Survey that are featured on drought.gov. Uh, in addition to data, maps, and tools, these pages show events, news articles, publications, and interdisciplinary research from this partner. You can click on any of these cards to learn more information about it. And this connection goes both ways. Whenever you view a document, map, or news story on drought.gov, you'll see a list of partners who are involved in its creation. By clicking on the logo of that partner, you'll be taken to the partner page where you can learn more information about that resource and other resources on drought.gov. In doing so, we've really worked to showcase how the federal government and other partners are working together to advance drought monitoring, prediction, planning, and research. Overall, while we launched the redesigned US Drought Portal in January of this year, we're constantly working to expand and improve upon this website going forward. For example, in the next few weeks, we'll be launching customizable maps using the ArcGIS online platform to allow users to view the datasets on drought.gov with greater customization. We're really excited for the future of drought.gov and working to make it an even better resource for drought decision makers across the US. You can view the website for yourself 
at www.drought.gov. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kelsey. Another great demonstration of the website. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Dr. Nick Nosler about the fire situation in the West. Nick? Hi, thank you. Uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about the significant fire potential outlook that was issued at the first of this month and is issued at the first of every month uh, going forward from August through September or October. And we'll talk about current conditions and current personnel in the field as well. Next slide. So current large incidents, this is of yesterday morning. Uh, we're at a preparedness level five, which is on a scale of one to five. So we're at the highest preparedness level, which means we have a number of incident management teams uh, out in the field, a large number of resources committed. As of this morning, uh, we have over 19,600 resources out in the field, and that will likely increase uh, in the coming weeks. The Northern Rockies and Northwest geographic regions are both at PL5 as well too. Uh, we moved to PL4 uh, in late June, which was the second earliest ever uh, since 1990. And we moved to PL5 about six days ago, uh, or five days ago, July 15th, uh, which is the early, second, third earliest, excuse me, since 1990. As I said, we have already 35 uh, plus incident management teams deployed of type one and type two. Uh, and that number will likely go up in the coming weeks as we have pending orders. Next slide, please. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that you know we're at we're forecasting fire activity and fire potential here at, at NIFSI and NIC, uh, but there's a m many other impacts. Smoke there on the left; those are air quality forecasts or uh, observations from yesterday morning, uh, and obviously flash flood watches uh, that were valid yesterday morning as well too. These are, are kind of incident. Uh, type of uh, impacts to the fires uh, where you have burn scars and heavy rain due to the monsoon uh, that produce debris flows. And then obviously the smoke from the wildfires uh, can create very unhealthy air, uh, not only for the firefighters, but communities downstream, uh, immediately downstream or even farther. Uh, we have you know, poor air quality in parts of Michigan into the Northeast uh, today due to smoke uh, from the wildfires in Canada. Next slide. So the National Significant Fire Potential Outlook, which I'm about to present to all of you, uh, like I said, it's updated the first of every month, uh, and we forecast fire potential out for the next four months. We usually delineate areas of ab above or below normal significant fire potential. What is significant fire potential? Well, we define a significant fire as a large wildfire that requires the mobilization of resources from outside the immediate area. Uh, so these are where you see your teams or a number of crews or personnel assigned to these fires. And they're usually more than just uh, one or two burn periods. They will last days, weeks, if not months. So when we create these outlooks, we look at drought conditions, snowpack conditions, uh, how much vegetation has grown in, from the spring into the early summer, uh, what the fuel loading is like, what type of fuel loading that is across some of those uh, more arid landscapes or grass dominated landscapes. Use that, look at future weather, future climate, uh, and compare that to climatological averages to give you uh, an outlook that is delineating above or below normal significant fire potential. These are great for planning. We use these for severity requests, uh, resource allocation and extension decisions. So uh, are we gonna bring more crews or aircraft on earlier in the season or keep them on later in the season? Uh, it's just one possibility uh, that is used for these uh, outlooks. Next slide, please. So for July, uh, I threw it in there because we're not quite done. Uh, and to show you uh, what we had forecasted at the beginning of the month, uh, we did a pretty good job, if I could say so. Uh, Southeast has been very wet uh, this year. We have had uh, increased fire activity above normal. They're in parts of North Dakota into Northern Minnesota as well. Uh, in the Southwest, which was much busier uh, in May into uh, late June has calmed down quite a bit due to the monsoon. Uh, so, but the above normal significant fire potential there uh, across the Northern Great Basin, uh, mountains and foothills of California and throughout much of uh, the Northern Rockies and Northwest that's come to fruition. Uh, as I mentioned, the Northern Rockies and Northwest have numerous large fires uh, on the landscape and both at their highest preparedness level. Next slide, please. Uh, moving into August, uh, 
this, like I said, this is about three weeks old, but I don't think this will change too much, uh, especially given the ongoing drought and the outlooks that John uh, presented earlier. Uh, we're still seeing above normal significant fire potential there in the northern parts of Nevada, Utah, throughout all of Idaho, Montana, most of Wyoming, and much of the uh, west coast as well too. Uh, some of this will bleed into the northern plains in northern Minnesota, uh, as they, you know, Minnesota typically has about 40 wildfires in July, and they are about three to 400 wildfires currently. Uh, that's not ongoing, but just the number of wildfires that they've reported. So uh, continued above normal potential across those areas. Uh, monsoon likely to continue, but as the lightning moves farther north into the Intermountain West, like we're seeing today and tomorrow, uh, and saw the last couple of days, uh, that provides chances for lightning ignitions, and then any sort of uh, removal of that moisture, uh, especially if any dry or windy conditions like we could see later this week, uh, that obviously exacerbates the fire uh, activity. Uh, and We get more fires and usually large fires behind those sort of conditions. Next slide, please. September, uh, given the amount of large wildfires that we have and some of the heavier fuels, the big timber uh, in the forests of the Northwest and Northern Rockies, uh, those don't just go out uh, easily. They usually need a lot of rain and usually snow uh, to make those fires you know, go down in activity or to be able to contain and control them. So lingering above normal significant fire potential is likely for a good part of the Northwest into the Northern Rockies and Idaho as well too. Uh, as John mentioned, maybe a return or a good chance of return to La Nina this fall and winter. We're hoping for some early season troughs to come in and slow us down earlier. But as we saw last year uh, with the Labor Day wind event, uh, the orientation and tracks of those troughs are very important because they can just as easily provide rain and snow as they do offshore winds across parts of the West Coast. So West Coast will likely continue to have above normal significant fire potential uh, through September, mostly due to the ongoing wildfire activity and the potential for offshore winds. Next slide. In October, uh, we're expecting much of the northern half of the Intermountain West and really almost the entire western United States to return back to normal significant fire potential. Although areas, especially offshore wind prone areas in California, uh, there in Southern and Northern California are likely to retain above normal significant fire potential uh, given the very dry fuels and potential for those offshore winds. Um, that is usually not a good uh, recipe for <laughs> trending downward with significant fire activity. So the potential will likely remain through October in parts of California. Next slide. So in summary, uh, we have a lot of large fire activity uh and not uh we're not to the typical peak of the fire season yet that's usually sometime in august as you said as i said you know second earliest to pl4 and third earliest to pl5 since 1990. uh the fuel dryness the vegetation is ahead of schedule it's been ahead of schedule pretty much the entire year due to the drought uh it's typical of peak fire season which is why we're seeing the amount of fires that we are Monsoon will continue shifting fire activity kind of to the west and north. Uh, we're hoping that holds on through August uh, and into September, although there are, as John mentioned, some indications that it might start to wane later this summer, uh, but hopefully they've received enough rain that they don't become uh, active again in parts of the southwest, Colorado, and southern Great Basin. Uh, the potential is there, but as we saw last year, you need critical fire weather patterns and conditions to realize this uh, potential. Um, and we've seen a few of those patterns materialize across the Western United States so far, and that's why we've gotten busy. Uh, we're hoping that those are more infrequent uh, and not a common occurrence because then we will get busier. So, and one thing just to finish up on is, you know, there's more impacts than just fire. Air quality, debris flows, uh, those things that we do consider kind of in the post-fire environment or uh, air quality uh, impacts due to a, a massive amount of smoke that's being produced, um, you know, we're aware of that and we're tracking that and something to be aware of uh, going forward for the public as well. End of report. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Nick. Again, we have just a, a minute or two for questions. So um, if you do have a question, remember to type it into the chat. In, I'm sorry, into the questions box, not the chat box, the questions box. I do have one question coming in for you, Kelsey, on your presentation. The question is, is, is there a portion of drought.gov that highlights funding opportunities and or resources available to states to mit, uh, for the mitigation of impacts from drought? 
Yes, so one section of drought.gov I didn't have a chance to cover in my demonstration was our research and learn section, which you can access from the main website menu. Within the research and learn section, there's a page called Drought Relief Recovery and Support, uh, which provides a list of programs and resources available for drought mitigation and recovery from NIDIS's partners across the federal government. Um, our research and learn section uh, also has a funding opportunities page for those looking for funding opportunities for drought research um, from NIDIS and our partners. Fantastic, thanks. And Nick, I have a question for you. How do you measure fuel load and curing? How do you determine which areas are really dry right now? So we do it through a number of ways. There's one using fire danger calculations where we use past weather and climate uh, based on different fuel models uh, that are representative of fuels in different areas. Uh, so those are calculations that we use to calculate fire danger, uh, energy release component, uh, 100 and 1,000 hour dead fuel moisture, those sorts of things. And those are tracked um, at station level and kind of larger area levels um, throughout the year. We also go out and sample uh, fuels in the field and measure the moisture quantity in those as well too. And we also look at fuel loading, you know, go take pictures. Uh, there's been some really good, uh, more advanced analysis in terms of trying to predict fuel loading based on uh, climate and ecosystem type of characteristics. Uh, and we put all those together. And like I said, it's a lot of science, but it's also a little bit of an art uh, trying to understand the fuel situation. Thank you. Thank you both again for your excellent presentations. We are going to move on now to um, to hear now from uh, from folks that are experiencing the drought um, in their communities, in their um, in the work that they do. So next up, we're going to hear about drought impacts from Western perspectives. Drought obviously impacts us all differently. We will hear about diverse drought impacts from multiple communities and industries across the West and about the experiences of those who are working to respond to and cope with current conditions. To start off this session, we will go to Jeff Schaefer from New Rockford, North Dakota. Mr. Schaefer has a cow-calf operation and small feedlot located in central North Dakota. He is the fifth generation on his family's diversified crop and livestock farm, which he runs along with his wife and two of his children. Jeff is currently serving as the North Dakota Stockman's Association president. I'll turn it over to you, Jeff. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you for this opportunity to share with you an update on the drought that plagues North Dakota and much of the Northern Plains. I have included a drought monitor slide and as you can see, 100% of the state is in a drought. With that being said, 92% of the state is in at least a severe drought category, and 48% is in an extreme drought category. This is coupled with an extended forecast that calls for above normal temperatures and below normal precipitation. All of this makes securing enough feedstuffs to feed a cow herd very challenging. We have asked for an early release of CRP for haying before the primary nesting season ends August 1st to help secure some additional feed. I know of some hay from, C hay from CRP that will end up going from the eastern part of the state to the west. The trucking bill will be higher than the hay itself for some of this feed. In most areas, the hay crop is 10 to 25% of normal. Minimal moisture and coupled with the late frost early hurt our alfalfa crop. Once it froze, it didn't come back because of the drought stress. We personally had three acres per bale of first cutting, which is typically the other way around. I've heard as high as seven acres per bale for hay. And to put that in a perspective, that is an area equal to seven football fields for a round bale, typically weighing 12 to 1400 pounds. Producers have chosen to cut small grain fields for hay versus harvesting them for grain as there just isn't enough forage to bale. Typically, some of these crops get armpit high on oneself, and this year it's boot high at best, and typically you can see a gopher run in front of your cutter bar. Pasture grass in some parts of North Dakota never did turn green. As one drove through North Dakota, it looked very different to see cows on brown grass in June. Some producers didn't turn out to grass because of reduced pasture stands. Another challenge with pastures is water. Several producers were proactive in developing water systems for their grass, but still fell short of the needs for this year. 
Supplies of water line and tanks is another challenge facing our producers this year, making developing water projects this year all the more challenging. I see a lot of water tanks and pastures and some type of trailer with a water tank on it for hauling water to cows. If one hasn't ever hauled water to cows, you truly can't appreciate how much they can drink. Typically, the sale barns throughout the state operate on an every other week schedule in the summer because of reduced runs. This year, all barns are open, filling a need of moving cow-calf pairs or yearlings off drought-stressed grazing to areas of the country with better feed availability. North Dakota had roughly 970,000 head of cows prior to the drought. Areas of the state have seen so far herd reductions of 10 to 25 percent with some complete herd liquidations. What we will end up with in the end for numbers is anyone's guess. Our auction market numbers indicate much higher than average marketings for this time of the year, with North Dakota markets reporting anywhere from a 10 to 60 percent increase year to date. In summary, North Dakota producers will need cropland acres of failed crops to secure enough feed. The big question mark now is will the corn crop make grain or roughage for the cows? We are in a critical time frame on this corn crop in North Dakota. Most days the corn plants look more like the top of a pineapple than a corn leaf as it does everything it can to conserve moisture throughout the heat of the day. Thanks for this opportunity to share the beef producer's story. I wish it was a better story, but know that beef producers are very resilient and resourceful. Please continue to pray for rain to secure a food supply for this country. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I wish I also wish the news was better. Um, thanks for sharing your perspective with us. Next up, we're gonna hear from Dr. Laura Fox. Dr. Fox is a senior epidemiologist with the Arizona Environmental Public Health Tracking Program at the Arizona Department of Health Services and Maricopa County Department of Public Health, both located in Phoenix, Arizona. She has over 10 years experience in infectious disease and environmental epidemiology and currently works on projects related to heat-related illness and linking environment and health data. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Fox. Hi. Um uh, Laura Fox, thank you for having me this afternoon. Um, at the Arizona Department of Health Services, drought and public health efforts are done in collaboration between the Environmental Public Health Tracking Program and Climate and Health Program. Our programs work together to monitor, track, and disseminate data on health conditions that may be exacerbated by drought. We also provide educational resources and target public health interventions such as supporting cooling center networks during the summertime months to prevent heat-related illness. Next slide, please. Drought can have many harsh effects on plants, animals, and the environment. It can also have lasting and broad impacts on human health, especially vulnerable populations. These include children, older adults, pregnant women, and low-income persons, as well as businesses that rely on water, people participating in outdoor water activities, and also people who rely on water from private wells, Two impacts that I wanted to briefly highlight from these examples on this slide include uh, wildfires and heat waves. First, a drought can bring conditions that intensify wildfires and dust storms, which can in turn increase the number of particulates in the air. This can worsen asthma and other heart and lung diseases like COPD. And the second example for heat, um, drought and extreme heat are intertwined. Unusually high temperatures and dry spells can contribute to drought severity. And in turn, drought can intensify the heat waves and cause increased injury and illness from heat-related illness like heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Next slide, please. Uh, we recently contributed to the Arizona Drought Preparedness Plan in 2020, published by the Arizona Department of Water Resources resources to describe drought and health efforts. There are numerous drought impacts in Arizona related to public health, but we focused on five priority areas, including water quality, air pollution, extreme heat, social vulnerability, and zoonotic diseases. Uh, we used public health data and statistics to inform decision makers and preparedness partners. Next slide, please. 
In addition to this work, uh, monitoring health status during moderate to severe drought years is feasible through the Arizona Department of Health Services Environmental Public Health Tracking Program. Now in our fourth year, public health partners can access and track environmental and health indicators in one location at different spatial scales and maps, charts and tables within our data explorer. Um, we have over 400 different indicators, but highlighted here are several drought-related indicators and include wildfire acres burned and number of wildfires by county, air quality, drinking water quality, heat-related illness and death, and social vulnerability indices. Our work in the past year has been delayed due to the COVID pandemic response, but we are actively updating years of data through 2020. Um, and for reference, there are several states in the Western region that receive funding through the CDC Environmental Public Health Tracking Program, and those include Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, California, Oregon, and Washington. And they may have similar data available in your state if you're looking to link public health and drought. Otherwise, the National CDC Environmental Public Health Tracking Program has numerous drought-related data and indicators through their Data Explorer. These will be linked in our chat box shortly. Uh, highlighted here in our data explorer are heat-related deaths from 2018 through 2020 by Arizona counties. There is an increasing trend in heat-related deaths in the state and Maricopa County, uh, highlighted here in the red trend line. Maricopa County, for reference, is where the city of Phoenix is. In 2020, we saw historical rec records with regard to heat and heat-related illnesses. There were 520 heat-related deaths and over 890 heat-related illness hospitalizations. Um, in the three years prior, heat-related illnesses, sorry, heat-related deaths increased, usually exceeding 250 deaths annually. Next slide, please. In addition to data sharing, we are currently monitoring several events that are impacted by drought, including tracking emergency department visits due to heat-related illness and extreme heat warnings, and monitoring air quality on respiratory health conditions due to recent wildfires. In the month of June alone, we were, act we were actively monitoring several wildfires that impacted several different areas in the state of Arizona and how wildfire smoke and air quality conditions impacted asthma and COPD illnesses. In prevention efforts, we are supporting local cooling center networks during the summertime months. And we continue to contribute to response plans that support drought decisions for drought declarations, and participate in public health emergency response activations, such as from the recent wildfires. Next slide. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Uh, you may contact me for questions or feedback in the email links provided here. And thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fox. Our next presentation will be from Nicole Viant. Um, uh, Nicole is the Acting Predictive Services Lead for the U.S. Forest Service Northern California Coordination Center in Redding, California. Her permanent position is as a fire management specialist with the Rocky Mountain Research Station as a technical lead for the Interagency Fuel Treatment Decision Support System and a subject matter expert for fire behavior models and quantitative wildfire risk assessments. Prior to this, Nicole was a seasonal wildland fire fighter herself and a fire ecologist across the West. Um, Nicole? Hi, thank you and good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, so I just wanted to show a graph that was seen earlier by David Simral. It's the drought impacts for the Northern California geographic area, which is within the black box. As you can see, the entire area is within a drought this year. So this is as of last week. Um, with about a third of it is an exceptional drought being the darkest red color, 57% in extreme and the remaining in moderate to severe drought. For comparison, um, last year at the same point in time, which was also a drought season, we had about 49% in that extreme category and only six in exceptional. So it just shows that the 2021 season, um, we are experiencing even more intense drought than we had last year in 2020. And if many people remember, 2020 was definitely a large fire season for Northern California, as well as most of the Western United States. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, again, as people have mentioned, and you can see in the images here, we've got a picture from Lassen National Park up at high elevation showing the snowpack on the top image was June 3rd of 2019 versus June 3rd of this year of 2021. So um, many of the mountainous areas within Northern California experienced low snowpack levels, which we saw earlier, as well as quite early melt off. Um, that coupled with minimal spring precipitation has impacted uh, both the live and dead fuel moistures we have outside in the, in the region. Um, the amount of grass and forbs that have grown within the area is variable. So some areas are normal levels of that crop and those are very, those contribute to rapid fire spread. Um, other areas are a little more minimal just because of the lack of precipitation. We also have seen in many elevations, the amount of moisture that the shrub component has been able to do, which we call green up, has been diminished this year. So not only have they not hit their peak greenness, they're also drying out a lot earlier than typically have seen before. Um, so coupling the lack of snowpack, the low precipitation, and then the many heat waves we've seen in the region, the fuel conditions are about four to six weeks ahead of normal. So typically the peak fire season is late August into early September for Northern California, but this year we are about a month, a month ahead of that. So we're seeing things in July that aren't typical due to the, the extended drought. Uh, next slide, please. So Nick Nosler talked a little bit about this um, in the Q&A. These are a couple of those indices that we track to understand how fire is going to, to behave within a given season. So um, both of the graphics have the same trend where it is the calendar year across the x-axis. So it starts at the beginning of January and it runs through December. The red lines are the maximum values for that day over the last 10 year period. And then the gray line is kind of the average for that day as we're trending and the blue is where we're at this year. So as you can see in the, the image on the left, this is the um, top left is the energy release component. And that's kind of an indicator of the heat that a fire will release when it's burning. Um, it brings in information about climatology, long-term trends, drought, et cetera, and it is very highly correlated to large fire growth. So at points where that um, trend gets above certain percentiles, around the 80th percentile, that's when you start seeing large fire growth potential for, for when they do start. Um, the top horizontal line is the 97th percentile, and you can see we have been above the 97th percentile since kind of mid-June already within our area and we're exceeding maximums that we've seen in the recent history. So it's just an indicator that things are very dry and there is great potential for um, getting large fires and large fire growth within the area. Another example is the, the image on the, the right hand side, that is our 1000 hour fuel moisture. So those are the large fuels. So anything that's larger than about three inches in diameter. Um, and those kind of indicate when they are available and they burn, they they give a lot of heat and they end up with dangerous fire behavior conditions. And talking to some folks out in the field that have been on some of these fires, even the smaller fires that we're seeing, they're saying there is full consumption of those fuels, which is very abnormal for this early in the fire season. So those are just two of the indices we track to understand how um, fire behavior and the potential will be for the summer. And the fact that we're seeing the levels we are exceeding maximums or minimums as the case may be for fuel moistures is painting a picture that the drought is impacting the fuel conditions that we're seeing on the ground and fires. We'll go with next slide, please. So um, this is just an image of a couple days ago of the large fires we've seen in Northern California. Um, we've had a very early start to the fire season this year. We've had about one and a half times as many fires themselves start. So we're at a couple days ago, we were at uh, 2,417 fires so far with just shy of 150,000 acres. And the acreage is also double about the 10 year average for this day um, or this point in time in the year. Uh, we're finding that a lot of these fires are fuels driven. Uh, they don't need the big wind events or other things to make the fire spread rapidly and grow large, uh, making it very difficult for our resources on the ground to do direct attack, to be able to try and get these fires controlled and contained at smaller sizes so they don't become large. Um, a lot of the fire spread, again, talking to the field, it's, it's exceeding the expectations of experienced fire managers. We're seeing fire behavior that's not typical, especially for July. Um, one example is most recently the Dixie fire, which is now about three times as big as it is in that map, even though it's quite small there. Um, it has been creating pyrocumulus clouds, which then end up creating their own weather. So the fires themselves are creating thunder cells, adding lightning and 
having downdrafts and wind that are pushing the fires and making them grow. So we're seeing lots of extreme fire behavior events. Uh, the Beckworth fire is also one of our first mega fires of the year. So a fire that started in early July has already exceeded 100,000 acres. Um, these conditions just between the, the drought, the lack of precipitation and the heat waves, they're making the fuels on the ground very primed to burn. And when fires do start, they are growing large much more rapidly than we're used to seeing. And it is definitely taking fire managers um, a little bit by surprise, but uh, it is becoming a more, a more normal. It's just much earlier in the season than we've seen before. So thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, okay, next up we have Dan Keppen, who is the Executive Director of the Family Farm Alliance, a nonprofit water organization that includes members in 17 Western states. Dan works and lives in Oregon's Klamath Basin. He has 32 years of experience in Western water resources engineering, policy, and association management, including 16 years with the Family Farm Alliance. He received his Master's of Science in Water Resources Engineering from Oregon State University and his Bachelor's of Science in Petroleum, Petroleum Engineering from the University of Wyoming. He is a registered civil engineer in California. Dan. Hi, uh, can you see me okay? Yep, okay. Yes. Great. Uh, good afternoon and, and, and thanks for this chance to talk about the drought disaster that we're facing across the West. Uh, my organization represents family farmers, ranchers, irrigation districts, and allied industries in 16 western states. We advocate for reliable water supplies to support uh, irrigation operations. Uh, I'm speaking to you today from Klamath Falls, Oregon. In May, the Bureau of Reclamation announced that no water would be diverted at the Klamath Project's A Canal for irrigation this year. The reason is a combination of drought and, and regulatory restrictions under the Endangered Species Act. For the first time since its construction in 1907, there is zero water available from the A Canal for irrigation or wildlife refuges. Throughout the West, this year is shaping up to be one of the worst in recent history, as you've heard today. I'll focus my remarks on impacts to ag producers, their communities, and the environment. Uh, these impacts are driven by a combination of extreme hydrology and, in many cases, regulatory inflexibility. The organizers of this webinar are looking for defined or observed drought impacts on the ground. Uh, we'll have some defined numbers later this, uh, this year. Um, for example, the University of California Merced is in the process of producing a study showing the economic impact of the drought on the ag sector in California. Uh, this should be out by the end of the summer. Uh, with that said, I have plenty of anecdotal observations to share. Uh, please advance to the next slide. Western farmers and ranchers are facing a brutal growing season as drought conditions drastically reduce water deliveries. Many are being forced to make uh, difficult decisions about the future of their operations. In the Colorado River Basin, as was mentioned earlier, uh, Lake Mead, which is backed up by Hoover Dam, is just 35% full, roughly. Due to the low Lake Mead levels, uh, ag producers served by the Central Arizona Project will soon see their allocations drastically reduced with zero water projected for 2023. Uh, as a gentleman from North Dakota just reported, livestock producers are being hit especially hard in this drought. Cattle ranches and dairy farms are liquidating their herds as they run short, uh, short of, of, of feed and water. Some farmers are tearing out certain crops to plant less water intensive ones, and others are letting their fields lie fallow. Yesterday, the Talent Irrigation District in Oregon's Rogue River Valley across the, the hills here shut off irrigation water well before crops are ready for harvest at local vineyards and, and orchards. So with the water turned off for good, irrigated pasture land and hay fields could start turning into fire hazards. There are many other impacts that crop up when once reliable surface water supplies are no longer available. Most importantly, no water for a farmer means no crops, no food, and a very limited ability to take care of his or her family. Farmers have mortgage payments, property taxes, irrigation district assessments, and equipment payments. Many producers have contracts that they have worked years to achieve and retain. If producers cannot deliver on those contracts, those contracts are lost. We're losing farm workers who are not only great employees, but are longtime valued members of our rural communities. The impacts of shutting down agriculture will further cause harm to ag supply businesses, 
and the drought also hits mom and pop businesses on Main Street. We're already seeing impacts to the environment in some agricultural areas, the wildlife, but particularly the waterfowl that rely on the canal system, ditch banks and irrigated fields are simply not there. Dust storms coupled with this horrific air quality that we're seeing from our burning forests pose health risks to farmers, workers, and the general public. When surface water supplies diminish or disappear, farmers turn to groundwater if they have access to it. In some areas, canal water is actually the prime source of recharge for shallow domestic wells. And that's not happening this year, at least here in the Klamath Basin and, and elsewhere in the West, because the canals are bone dry. Increased groundwater pumping to replace lost surface water will continue to draw down water levels further. Thousands of wells in California's San Joaquin Valley, the Klamath Basin, and elsewhere are at risk of drying up this summer. Many households are relying on bottled water to drink. Rural residents who don't even farm are having to stay with family and friends to shower and wash clothes. Uh, please advance to the next slide. So finally, the fear of deadly wildfires is on everyone's mind. This slide here uh, was once a beautiful wilderness area, an hour's drive from where I live. Next slide, please. This is what it looked like Thursday night, part of the bootleg fire, which is the largest fire in the country right now. More fires have already burned at this point of the year than in any other year in the past decade. Wildlife also pose a threat to watershed health and the safety of source drinking water throughout the West. The current drought crisis underscores some key concerns. Uh, next slide. So first, water infrastructure is needed to protect future water supply reliability. A national coalition of over 220 organizations recently urged Congress to include Western water infrastructure provisions in any potential infrastructure or economic recovery package. Next slide, please. Water management in the West is becoming too inflexible. Water users served by federal uh, Western water projects, including but not limited to California's Central Valley Project, the Klamath Project, and Columbia River Basin, are facing regulatory droughts as well. Surface water that was originally developed to supply farms and ranches has now been directed to meet priorities driven by the implementation of federal environmental laws, such as the Endangered Species Act. We need a, a new way of looking at how we manage our limited water resources. We need a broader view of how water is used, one that considers population growth, food production, and habitat needs. Next slide, please. Fierce Western wildlife disasters are becoming an annual occurrence. This underscores the importance of improving on the ground management actions that can lead to improved forest health, which benefits every Western watershed. Next slide, please. Now is the time for collaboration and not confrontation. I was pleased to see that Bitta Becker from the Navajo Nation will be speaking next. Earlier this year, our organization formally supported the Universal Access to Clean Drinking Water for Native Americans initiative. Now more than ever, ag producers, tribal and conservation groups need to come together. If we don't, the public policies and resource management strategies that we need to maintain a viable and sustainable rural West will be impossible to achieve. I think the only silver lining that this crisis uh, could give us is it will hopefully draw more uh, public and political attention. Uh, this could lead to needed reasonable policies that support farmers and investment in rural communities, including uh, water infrastructure. So in the short term, we recommend a fast track response capability from USDA and Interior that enables a localized response by farmers and ranchers. This unprecedented west-wide drought requires a level of reaction that is immediate and sustainable. Last slide, please. Uh, so we look forward to continuing our work with the administration to address these pressing issues. Thanks again for this opportunity to, to talk with you today. Thank you so much, Dan. Our next presentation is from Bitta Becker from the Navajo Nation, currently serving as an associate attorney for the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority. Ms. Becker is the immediate past director of the Navajo Nation Division of Natural Resources. She also serves on the leadership team for the Water and Tribes Initiative in the Colorado River Basin, co-leading the universal access to clean water for tribal communities, on the New Mexico Interstate Stream Commission and on the Navajo Nation Water Rights Commission. Bitta?
we can't hear you, but I think you, you're um, still on mute. Great, sorry about that. There you go, can perfect, you, thank you. Can you see me as well? Yes, I can. Wonderful. Well, thanks, Dan, for the kind introduction. I felt exactly the same way when I saw you on today's webinar. I was very encouraged to see the diverse voices and to see the voices of people who are trying to make sense of water in the West. So I'm gonna be talking today about the intersected nature of water and therefore the intersected nature of how drought impacts the daily lives of people living on the Navajo Nation in many, many ways. Um, so I'm gonna list several activities and groups of people that are vulnerable to drought on the Navajo Nation. And then I'll talk a little bit more about some of these categories. I won't go into detail on some of the categories because many of these categories have been discussed already. Um, so some of the groups and activities on the Navajo Nation that are particularly vulnerable to drought are a group of people we call water haulers. And Dan mentioned that earlier, to just, just a few minutes ago. It's estimated that 30 to 40% of the homes on the Navajo Nation lack piped water. This means people are living in homes without flushing toilets and running water. So they have to go drive and get, um, they fill like a 2000 gallon tank with water, maybe 1500, maybe a thousand, depending on your home and your abilities. And you fill that and bring your water home. And they that's filled with clean treated drinking water. Um, another category of vulnerable activities here on the nation is our public water systems generally. I'm with the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority. We have 98 uh, public water systems that we operate and maintain. And as was discussed earlier, our dry land farmers are impacted by drought, our irrigators are impacted by drought, our ranchers are impacted by drought. And I wanna uh, give a little bit of a nuanced definition of ranchers for the Navajo Nation. Um, it includes people who try to make a living off of um, raising and selling cattle, but it also includes a large number of Navajo families who um, feel it's very important to keep and maintain a herd or a flock of sheep to maintain traditional and cultural ties to the land. As was discussed earlier, wildlife is affected, um, wildfires are on the rise, uh, Navajo, most people don't know that the Navajo Nation has the oldest growth forests in the Southwest. We've not had a wildfire this year, but in the forest, but we did last year at the height of the COVID pandemic. That was definitely salt in a wound when that happened. Um, one area we haven't discussed in too much detail is energy, how the drought is affecting energy supplies and recreation. Next slide, please. So where is the Navajo Nation and why is this affecting us so much? Um, so I didn't put up the drought map. I thought it was more important to situate um, where the Navajo Nation was in the United States. As you can see, we are in the heart of the Colorado River Basin. We, um, the, we straddle both the upper and lower basin. Currently, from the July 13th data, 100% of the Navajo Nation is in severe to exceptional drought conditions and 96% is experiencing extreme to exceptional drought. You heard earlier David Simmerall mention that in spring 2020, much of the US was not in drought. Regrettably for the Navajo Nation in the spring, much of the nation was already in the severe drought, drought stage. We have been the epicenter for what some call the mega drought for many years. Uh, so much so that last month, the current president of the Navajo Nation reaffirmed a 2018 state of emergency drought declaration. So as I said, I wanna briefly discuss a few areas um, that I've mentioned before, areas of vulnerability. And I'm gonna start in the Western part of the Navajo Nation um, and focus on the Colorado River Storage Project Act and Hoover Dam Power. Um, 50, this is an interesting factoid, 57% of NTUA's power supply is from non-carbon sources. Uh, we have a, a couple of solar farms, but the vast majority, almost 50% of our on-reservation power supplies coming from the Colorado, the Crisp Power and the Hoover Dam Power. The low reservoir supply means that the power cannot be generated. Um, and so therefore they must look off, they must purchase 
uh, more expensive power to supply places that rely on crisp and Hoover Dam power. That's, that's challenging because our customers rely on um, some of this, this, the, the least expensive power that's available in the West. Um, and then very quickly on recreation, when you look in the West, you'll see Lake Powell, sort of, it's not labeled, but that big blue area is Lake Powell. Um, that area includes lands that were exchanged with the federal government, so they could submerge Navajo lands and create Lake Powell and create Page. There are many Navajo vendors and people who operate on a Navajo marina that are going to be affected by Lake Powell's low water um, supplies. And again, salt on the wound is, it was really COVID that cut back on recreational uses. Next slide, please. So let me let me wrap up with talking about what Dan highlighted is our domestic water haulers. Um, in the western part of the Navajo Nation, and it's hard to see, but uh, sorry about the quality of this slide. Down where it says Dilcon, some of the shout there was a water well that was supplying livestock users that went out of service. So our livestock users started to use the clean drinking water water hauling stations that then dropped the tank levels of our community water system. So regrettably, NTUA has had to ask people to ration the amount of water they're taking out of these clean drinking water systems. So it's very real. This, uh, the drought is very, very real here in the Navajo Nation. One drought mitigation effort that I do want to talk about is the Navajo Gallup Water Supply Project that's being built off of the San Juan River in New Mexico went online last October, and it's a much more sustainable surface water supply that can help prevent the impacts that we're feeling from drought. So I wanna end there. Thank you so much for your time. I will. I do wanna um, provide the website for, some, for tribalcleanwater.org. It's the effort that Dan mentioned, which is getting universal access to clean drinking water for all Native Americans across this entire United States. And I will end with, reminding everybody water is life and echo the statement that let's all continue to pray for rain. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beda. Um, and finally, in this panel, we will hear next from Dimitri Polizas. Dimitri is the resource planning team manager at the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, the regional water wholesaler for 19 million people. Dimitri leads the technical staff responsible for conducting Metropolitan's Integrated Water Resources Plan, a long-term water strategy to provide its service area with reliable supplies of high quality water to meet present and future needs in Southern California. Dimitri? Great, thank you, Viva. And again, thank you for the opportunity to provide our perspective uh, on the drought uh, situation. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Great, so just a little bit about Metropolitan. We, as mentioned, uh, we are the regional wholesaler for roughly 19 million people here in Southern California. Uh, we span six counties, portions of six counties, 5,200 square uh, miles of uh, area. Um, and so we um, here in Southern California have a diverse regional uh, water supply. Uh, this map here uh, gives you an indication of, of the, the components that make up that diverse water supply. Uh, the first component is our imported water supply. Um, we have access to water off of the Colorado River, uh, which the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation uh, maintains and operates that system. Uh, that water flows through the Colorado River, the key facilities like Powell, Lake Mead. We uh, uh, take that water off the Colorado with our Colorado River aqueduct and bring it to Southern California. Um, our apportionment on that system is 550,000 acre feet. And for those who are not as familiar, you can imagine one acre foot is about, is about uh, think of a football field filled with one foot of water. That's an acre foot. And that's enough water to supply a, three households, three Southern California households for a year. Um, that's a general rule of thumb. Of course, that'll, that changes, um, but that's just one way of, of thinking about what an acre foot of water is. Um, on, we have developed, and with our member agencies, we're comprised of 26 member agencies, we've developed additional supplies off the Colorado. So in addition to that basic apportionment of 550,000 acre feet, uh, we can actually double, we have doubled that supply. So our supply on that system is roughly 1 million acre feet per year, give or take. 
Our other imported water supply is from Northern California. Uh, the, uh, we have a contract with the Department of Water uh, Resources in California. Um, our contract with the state is for roughly 2 million acre feet, just under 2 million acre feet. Um, that is subject to availability. Um, and the last time we got our full allocated amount was back in 2006. Since that time, we've seen our allocation fluctuate from 5% all the way up to 80% or so. Um, and so th those are our two imported water supplies. We also have uh, what we call our local supplies. So that's the supply that is generated within the region. Our member agencies develop uh, local supplies, whether it's groundwater, recycled water, uh, desalination or, con or conservation efforts, which help to manage uh, demands. Um, in addition to that, we have our storage. Metropolitan has invested in storage. Uh, that uh, storage network is vast. It is both in our service area and outside of our service area, and it covers uh, its uh, facilities of either groundwater or uh, service area storage. If we can go to the next slide. So as we've been talking all day here, we have been experiencing um, dry conditions in the last the last two years. Um, this graphic here is showing us the uh, peak snowpack associated with the two watersheds uh, for our imported supplies. Um, and although the, the peak snowpack uh, came in below average, what we're seeing is the resulting runoff is, is way below, lower than what we have, would anticipate. Um, and again, those dry conditions, those persistent dry conditions, the dry soils and the, the heat, uh, we're really not seeing that snowpack produce runoff. As a result, um, our allocation on the state water project this year is just 5%. So our normal or our typical average is somewhere around 60% or so. Uh, we got 5%, which represents just under 100,000 acre feet on that system. Um, in Lake, on our Colorado River side of the house, we have um, issues with Lake Mead, as we've been talking about, and that reservoir has dropped to its lowest level since uh, its initial filling. Um, and then on the bright side, though, we have been able to take advantage of wet periods over the last several years to uh, stack water into our storage facilities. And we've been able to actually start this year with the most storage that we've had. And, and that's, that is what um, helps us get through some of these drier periods is the work that we've done leading, out to the drought, leading up to the droughts. If we can get to the next slide. So some of the impacts that we're seeing. Um, so for Southern California, this year we're prepared for the dry conditions. Um, we were prepared for last year's conditions and for this year. What we're mostly concerned with is the third or fourth year of, of drought. And we've certainly seen extended drought periods in the past. Um, so our concern here is that the outlook on both of our imported water supply systems are, is pretty bleak. Um, I can't tell you what our allocation is going to be next year on the state water project, but given where reservoir levels are, um, we are certain that we are going to have a low initial allocation. And in fact, we're planning for a 0% um, initial allocation uh, as we start the year uh, next year. And re regarding uh, our Colorado River supplies, um, we are anticipating the first ever shortage declaration on that system for the lower basin. Um, and this is dictated uh, on water level levels in Lake Mead. And so given where they're projecting levels to be next year or at the end of this year, um, the first ever shortage declaration is certainly um, is, is something that we're anticipating for next year. Now, California and Metropolitan will not necessarily have a, uh, any impacts uh, at this first uh, shortage tier level. However, given where the uh, Lake Mead uh, water level projections are heading, uh, and, and as those get lower and lower, we do anticipate um, impacts uh, perhaps in the second year out from now or even the, and the, maybe even the, the third year as well. So a bleak, bleak outlook on both those systems. So what we are trying to do here is preserve um, a, a, the water that supplies that we do have and extend that water that we do have for as many years out as possible. Uh, should the drought continue. One of the things that we're noticing that um, somewhat unexpected, but really um, reared its, shall I say, ugly head this year because of the persistent and the frequency of these low allocations on the state water project, is that it's highlighting a challenge um, in metropolitan service area where 
Um, there are areas that can only receive water from one source, um, one of our imported water supply sources. And that, and specifically, that is uh, areas that can only receive water from the state water project. Um, and there are challenges for us in, in those areas, especially when we're seeing these low uh, allocations. Uh, we'll be able to manage through this year, but we're really uh, concerned about what will happen uh, in the next year or two years if we continue to see these low allocations. So we can go to the next slide. So a lot of what we're focusing on uh, this year is preserving our limited state water project supplies. And we're doing that through different um, uh, different ways. We're adapting our normal operations. So we typically like to blend our supplies from our Colorado River and the state water project. But given the low allocation this year on the state, um, we're really not blending at all. We're pushing as much of that Colorado River water uh, into our service area. Um, and we're going even beyond that. And so that's not a typical operation, but we're going even beyond that and doing these extraordinary actions where we're asking our agencies who have flexibility, who have multiple connections with us to use connections that are uh, solely um, Colorado River connections and back off of the state water project uh, connections. Uh, we're also actually making physical changes to our distribution system to physically move water into areas, Colorado River water, into areas that typically only get state water project. So these are uh, extraordinary actions that we're taking in order to preserve um, uh, the state water project allocated water that we got this year and also any of the water that we have stored from prior years on the state water project side. Uh, so we want to preserve those supplies as much as we can and stretch them out as much as we can. Um, other things that we're doing, uh, we're increasing our conservation and outreach and programs. So that's uh, education, that's uh, awareness uh, campaigns. Um, these are rebates on devices. Um, we're, we're ramping those up, and that is consistent with and supporting of the governor's call for a voluntary 15% conservation uh, that he uh, put in effect uh, earlier this year. 50 of the 58 counties in California are under a drought emergency. The counties associated with metropolitan service area are not under an, a, an emergency at this point in time but we recognize uh, what the rest of the state is going through. And we also recognize where, where, um, where we are heading, especially if next year and the following year are dry as well. So the, these are the things we want to put in motion now and have been in prior years, but ramping up those efforts now so that we can stretch out those supplies as much as we can in the in subsequent years. Um, the other thing that we're considering is actually changing our uh, water supply condition level. This is our communication tool. You can think of this as a uh, DEF COM level. Uh, you can see we, they're, they're color coded. Um, and so we are currently in a water supply watch, which is that yellow tier. Uh, we are considering going into uh, the orange tier, which is a water supply alert. Uh, this really amps up and com communicates the urgency of the region's water supply situation. Um, and that it, the, the message there is that we need to continue to conserve water and continue those practices that Southern California has really um, grasped over the last several years. Um, just one quick stat, we have seen a, uh, I think it is a 40% reduction uh, in our per capita water use since the 90s. And since that time, we've grown uh, in population by over 5 million people. So we are doing what we can, we have been doing, and we just need to continue doing that. And that's our key message. Um, so the next slide, please. That that really wraps up what I've had to, uh, what I wanted to uh, say today. But uh, so in summary, we are, we are managing through this year, recognizing um, things are not looking good for next year. Um, and so we're putting things into effect this year to preserve those supplies and and stretch them out. Um, and really um, the, the conservation message um, and having the region conserve, continue to conserve is really what allowed us to start this year with the most uh, storage that we've ever had. And that allows us to get through these drier periods. So again, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Dimitri, for your presentation. And thank you all um, for sharing your stories, your perspectives with us, um, all very, valuable information. Um, I'm going to now turn our attention to the last uh, panel of this webinar. Um, before I do that, before I turn it over, I'm going to just give a little bit of a background. 
So we will now be joined by the Interagency Drought Relief Working Group. Um, on April 21st, President Biden announced the formation of an interagency drought relief working group to address worsening drought conditions in the West and support farmers, tribes, and communities impacted by ongoing water shortages. Over the next, uh, the next uh, half hour or less, unfortunately, um, representatives from the U.S. Department of the Interior and the U.S. Department of Agriculture will discuss the work being done across the federal government to address the current drought and fire conditions and current efforts to provide relief. I've already introduced and welcomed Assistant Secretary Tanya Trujillo and Deputy Undersecretary Gloria Montano Green. I would also like to welcome Camille Kaminlin Tutan, the Deputy Commissioner of the Bureau of Reclamation, and Carlos Suarez, the California State Conservationist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resource, Resources Conservation Service. So to start off this session, I will turn it over to Assistant Secretary Trujillo. Thank you, Viva. Thank you again. It's nice, very nice to be here, part of back, back with you after listening to the very impressive number of presentations and perspectives that we heard as part of this presentation, as part of the workshop. The, the information is very sobering and uh, I want to express as much empathy as possible to the communities that are out there in the West that are experiencing some of those un, unprecedented condi conditions that we heard about uh, and coupled with the fire and the threats of potential destruction as a result of the fires that are going on or that will be coming later this summer is something that we're all very mindful of. We, we appreciate being able to present some closing remarks as part of the meeting today. And uh, in, in reflecting on what we heard, it was I guess it's a bit of a silver lining that we are able to have this kind of a virtual presentation that includes people from a variety of, of perspectives and a variety of places all coming together in the same in the same program today. Uh, but it, it will be nice to be able to be out there in the communities and talking with you directly as we move forward um, throughout the summer with our with our uh, efforts to try to be responsive to what we're seeing and hearing in this type of a program. The, uh, the, I'm, I'm very pleased to be part of the Biden administration in, in trying to address the concerns of climate change. There's no doubt that that has been a priority for President Biden as he has uh, established his presence in, in the programs that we have been working on and hearing about today. The, uh, the working group that was mentioned by Viva is chaired by the Department of the Interior. Secretary Holland is um, the chair along with Secretary Vilsack at the Department of Agriculture. And it is just one demonstration of the, the White House level of attention that is, has been placed on these issues. I would also note that President Biden recently met with a group of Western governors and uh, had a discussion about their priorities and concerns, and in, in particular had a focus on addressing some of the wildfire issues and uh, has moved forward with uh, initiatives and support for trying to increase relief and um, improve the the compensation available to those first responding uh, folks that are working on a daily basis on these issues. The, um, the remarks today have been a good, very good opportunity to hear from you, hear from what you are, hear about the conditions that you are dealing with and really reflects back on what we're trying to do through the working group process of using our existing authorities to provide relief and, and provide opportunities to, to address the concerns based on the available resources that we have 
today, the available authorities that we have today, but we are also looking forward to additional uh, opportunities to build resources, to, to build our programs, and to uh, improve upon the, the outreach and the, the relief opportunities that we have to provide. We, uh, I think it's very beneficial for us to have the interagency coordination that we have going on in the context of the Department of the Interior and the Department of Agriculture. We have discovered that we have some overlapping authorities that we can utilize to try to fill in gaps with respect to what, what our various programs are able to do. Uh, but again, we're, we're working together to try to improve upon those resources. And we're very hopeful that we will be able to uh, look forward to additional infrastructure funding and additional authorities that are resulting from the ongoing negotiations and discussions among the White House and the, the bipartisan uh, congressional group that has been working over the past several months on some proposals and, and programs that we can utilize to, to put relief on the ground again as quickly as possible. The, the interagency working group that we have again was uh, initiated through a meeting of the National Climate Task Force which includes representation from, from several agencies and has, has very carefully focused on the drought conditions that we are seeing. The uh, other programs that we will be working to support are the National Drought Resilience Partnership, which has been ongoing for some time. And we are uh, trying to be very careful and strategic about utilizing the existing programs we have and making sure that we can uh, support the efforts of, of the scientists and the the program folks that have been working across many agencies to try to provide information to local communities and try to help share information about uh, what the conditions we are seeing and facing around the West. In addition, we have uh, continued the efforts through the water subcabinet, which again, utilizes the water expertise among various agencies and can also address issues that go beyond drought because as, as many folks know, in addition to drier conditions in some areas and in, in many areas around the West, we have seen some more unpredictable and erratic rainfall in some areas that have led to uh, flooding conditions. And so we're thinking about how to utilize uh, some shared authorities and, and try to work among our various agencies to address flood conditions and, and flood risks as well. And uh, we also share with respect to authorities associated with drinking water and, and ensuring that we can provide secure drinking water supplies uh, for our tribal communities. There's an in initiative to try to help support some of the issues that that Peter Becker was referring to as well, but also rural rural communities and address the concerns that Dan Dan Kepin was raising. It, um, similarly, uh, similarly important of trying to ensure that we can reach our rural rural drinking water um, needs, and then also disadvantaged communities. That uh, this is a program in particular that EPA is trying to focus on and think about how to make sure we can improve and repair, again, in the infrastructure context, some of the um, critical uh, infrastructure needs that we need. We need to ensure that we can have clean, reliable drinking water for all of, all of our populations around the country. The, so the continued collaboration among our federal agencies will continue, and no doubt about it, that we are working very closely with the non-federal partners. As I began with in the start and very, very grateful for the opportunity to be able to, to continue to do that. I know next up we will hear from Camille Klimlim, who is the Deputy Commissioner from the Bureau of Reclamation, one of the main entities that I work with at the Department of the Interior. 
but I also want to take an opportunity to acknowledge the role and the valuable contributions from the U.S. Geological Survey, the USGS. I know their programs such as the stream gauging programs and the network of stream gauges that exist, thousands of stream gauges that exist around the country provide very helpful information and valuable uh, information for our water quantity concerns and, and, and uh, measuring measurements that are critical to ensuring we know where water is going, when, but also in the water quality context and uh, just hearing more about the impacts from last year's fires in Colorado, for example, and knowing that we need to be able to be very attentive to the water quality concerns that we are facing around the West as well. In, in addition, USGS has the Landsat programs that I know um, very many of you are familiar with and, and supportive of and provide critical earth observation data to our communities and apply in very, very many different contexts to help ensure that we have accurate information and reliable science to help guide our decision making over the next uh, several years. And they are also in the process of developing some evolving tools, and I am looking forward to continuing to work with them and continuing to, to hear feedback from, from the water users and from the communities that they are engaging with. So I uh, just appreciate, again, the ability to be with you today, to be representing the Biden-Harris administration as we work through issues together uh, over the next few months and years. And I uh, look forward to hearing from the rest of the federal panel here, but then also want to just really thank the folks at NIDIS and, and Viva in particular for putting together this program. Thank you for hearing. Thank you for all of the presenters who provided information that we will continue to be processing and, and absorbing as we think about how to uh, continue our work on a on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you very much and look forward to hearing from uh, Deputy Commissioner Tutin next. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Trujillo, and I'm so pleased to be joining this panel also with Deputy Undersecretary Montano Green and USDA and NRCS. As Tanya mentioned, my name is Camille Klimlim Tutin, and I am the Deputy Commissioner for the Bureau of Reclamation. The Bureau of Reclamation is the largest purveyor in the nation. We deliver water to 31 million people and one out of five farmers irrigating 10 million acres of land across the American West. We are also the second largest producer of hydropower, providing enough, uh, producing enough power to provide power to 3.5 million homes across 17 Western states. With an agency, with an, our mission as water, the drought has had significant impact on our operations, and as, as you've heard today, on the people that we serve. And no single agency will be able to solve all of the issues created by the drought which is why it is important that this interagency working group provides a forum to coordinate our activities to get the maximum impact. An all of government approach and engagement at the highest levels, and especially on a monumental a year like this on drought is exactly what this administration is doing. For the Bureau of Reclamation, our first um, line of defense is to work with our stakeholders in addressing the drought on multiple fronts. We work with the tribes, the states, and with irrigators and farmers, conservation groups on multiple projects across the West. Um, some of that work has already paid dividends for us in how we're operating this year. An example of that would be on the Colorado River, the 2007 interim guidelines, and the 2019 drought contingency plan have set the groundwork for our response to this year's hydrology and the hydrology moving forward. Reclamation is also managing in the moment and providing immediate relief to hard hit areas through the use of our existing authorities 
and in um, collaboration with our partners like USDA and NRCS and the states. For example, Reclamation is coordinating with our amazing partner in Carla Nemeth and the Department of Water Resources in California for state-specific activities, um, including um, groundwater substitution, science investments, and construction of salinity barriers in the Delta to deal with this drought. We've taken emergency actions. You've heard from Dan Keppen, the dire situation that we have at the Klamath Basin. And as of last week, Reclamation deployed $15 million in immediate assistance to the Klamath Project through the Drought Relief Agency. You also will be providing $3 million in additional funding for technical assistance to tribes within the Klamath Basin. And some of the speakers today have also touched on reservoir operations. Um, whether it's on the Colorado River or in the, uh, or in the Central Valley project. Those are another tool that we're using in this year's drought. And finally, an important part of this conversation is infrastructure water. projects. And we are looking at new water supplies and infrastructure projects, new storage water projects where it's appropriate, groundwater recharge projects, increased access to reliable sources of water, and water reuse projects. One example of that is our work with the Fryant Kern Canal. It's a half a billion dollar construction project that would restore delivery capacity to an important infrastructure facility in the Central Valley project. Reclamation is also evaluating ways to build back better, to use our existing infrastructure, to answer uh, the issues of drought, but really to build resiliency across the West. Uh, one of those examples is um, a pool raise at Clay Ellum Dam in Washington State, which is part of the Yakima project. Um, raising this reservoir will result in roughly 15,000 acre feet of new storage. That new storage will provide water for irrigators, but also in-stream flows for fish rearing habitat and migration. And a part of this as well is in planning and science. Um, many of you saw the maps regarding snowpack regarding uh, snow water uh, equivalent content as well as the soil moisture content. And so we are focused on long-term planning through research and development, on climate science, on innovative strategies to improve long-term planning and forecasting. One of those tools that we just released was our 2021 Secure Water Act report which we finalized in March of 2021. One of the tools that we're deploying this year is our Water Smart program. This includes uh, grants regarding drought resiliency, Title 16, and conservation and efficiency improvements. The Title 16 program, which includes construction for desalination and water recycling, is in partnership with local government entities. And since its enactment in 1992, the Bureau of Reclamation has invested in $761 million. When combined with the cost share by our local partners, this has resulted in a 3.4 billion investment in water reuse. And in 2020 alone, water reuse funded through the Title 16 program delivered over 420,000 acre feet of recycled water helping to provide flexibility to water managers in diversifying our water supply. We've also provided numerous water grants and our, 22, um, our fiscal year 22 budget includes $54.1 million for Reclamation's Water Smart programs. Cumulatively, Reclamation's Water Smart and Title 16 projects from 2010 to 2020 are expected to have resulted in a water savings of nearly 1.5 million acre feet. Assistant Secretary Trujillo touched on this as well. And we are working with the administration through the American Jobs Plan and with Congress on mapping out potential use of supplemental funding and authorities that may be coming in an infrastructure package. We at Reclamation, uh, many of our employees live within the communities that are suffering in this drought. Um, it is something that is both professionally and personally important to 
the 5,400 employees that serve at the Bureau of Reclamation, and our hearts go out to all of those impacted. We are happy to share these information with you, to have these conversations in real time, and to deal with this drought in the moment and for to find a path forward into the future. We look forward to hearing from you and providing additional ways that we can work together. And we thank NIDIS for the opportunity to, to be here with you today. Thank you very much and thank you, Assistant Secretary Trujillo. Thank you very much, Camille. We know we're running a little behind, but we also wanted to be sure to hear from our important partners at the Department of Agriculture and happy to hand it over to, the, to them. Very much appreciate their, their important role as we work together on these issues. Thank you, Assistant Secretary. Thank you. Neil. Um, hi again, Gloria Montaño Green um, with the Department of Agriculture, Farm Production and Conservation. And I think to be able to share that it, quite a few was highlighted throughout of how producers are impacting, are being impacted by the drought. And I think one of the things to consider is that when we talk about water in agriculture, it's just farmers aren't just using water for use. It's they're turning it into food, they're turning it into fiber. They're helping to restore uh, communities and ecosystems. They're creating food clothing for this country, um, building communities and supporting local economies. And so when it's looking at the impact that agriculture is having due to drought, there's, there's, there's great concern. Uh, the NDRP work and the interagency working group has been shared um, quite a bit. So I'm gonna try to reserve my comments to more looking at some of the programs of relief that we provide and just making sure if you are interacting with a producer, if you are a producer on this call, that one of the first things you should consider is making sure to contact your farm service agency office or your NRCS um, county office to be able to get some relief. One of the things we wanna recognize and the secretary has regularly asking us about the status of any types of programs and flexibilities that we have in our programs is to be able to think of what do we have available to provide some support, relief and planning and uh, immediate support and long-term and what additional authorities and work do we need? Some of it was shared on the upcoming bipartisan, um, hopefully passage of the infrastructure plan and how that can work on, on providing some support um, and some long-term. Uh, but the slides have been attached and shared, just wanting to run through a few of the programs that we do have available within the FSA, and then I'll have my colleague Carlos, who works with NRCS, look at some of the more long-term work to be considered um, working with USDA. So I'm not going to go over quite a few of the data analysis and the, and the data work that we have here in the research to be able to prepare and to be able to model and, and, and think about what the needs are. I'm just going to go through some of the programs that we have for um, some immediate relief, some recent flexibilities we have, and then I'll hand it over to Carlos on, on a recent program he's introduced or he's worked on in California and some of the long-term work that can happen at NRCS. So we have various programs. The Emergency Conservation Program can be able to assist with any natural disaster um, and looking at emergency water conservation support during drought. Make sure to call your FSA office. Um, we also have the Non-Insured Crop Disaster assistance program for those that are having low yields or loss of inventory uh, in the crop industry, and the tree assistance program uh, due with cost share assistance for orchards and nurseries. And the livestock and feed community, uh, the, the ranchers, we have, uh, get the next slide please. Uh, we have the livestock forage program uh, once that is assigned and um, designated as a trout area. Um, there's compensation that can be given to the producers. Uh, there also is the emergency assistance for livestock, honeybees, and farm fish uh, programs, which is called ELAP, which can assist with the cost of transporting water to grazing livestock due to the drought. One thing is it does not cover uh, losses due to drought because LFP covers that. So this is the water hauling one. 
Uh, we also have the Emergency Forest Restoration Program. There's far, quite a few of you that are private foresters and which we assist in the restoration of privately owned forests damaged by disasters, including drought. Next slide, please. We also have some loan support, uh, emergency loans to be able to have low interest loans to be able to um, support with the production losses and physical losses and then operating loans for any replacements or adjustments I need to have. I'm going to, if I can go two slides next, uh, I want to talk about the crop and disaster assistance program because we've recently announced a few flexibilities in the program and want to make sure that in addition, one more slide please. In addition to the crop insurance work um, that we're most familiar with, we've had some recent flexibilities added, uh, one allowing to have um, pay, graze, or chop uh, cover crops for silage, haylage, or baleage at any time and still receive the prevented planning payment. So that is a flexibility um, that should be considered and you should talk to your, um, your insurance provider about it um, and then 13th last week, we authorized emergency procedures to help uh, producers uh, and to be able to streamline and accelerate the way that they can uh, uh, request losses um, with their uh, producers, um, with their AIPs. Sorry, uh, approved insurance providers. Sometimes we talk in acronyms and trying to translate it in my head uh, to be able to extend those deadlines. Uh, so to be able to work with them, your AIPs and accelerate those losses instead of waiting till the end of the crop season. So those are some recent flexibilities that have been forward. Uh, I do want to share that earlier there was conversation about the CRP um, and the, that's the Conservation Reserve Program and some of the flexibilities needed for um, haying and grazing. Wanted to provide that we have been looking at this quite a bit on what is our ability to move. So we do not have authority by statute to allow emergency haying during the primary nesting season, specifically the gentleman is from North Dakota, which um, that I believe is mid-August, but I will make sure to, to get that, um, or sorry, August 1st. However, if the county is eligible and has a drought designation, those are eligible for emergency grazing, which the Farm Bill does allow to begin during the primary nesting season. So there is that distinction. Um, and so we understand there are changes to, to be made. Um, and so I guess like in, in thinking of it, we hear of the needs for relief, some of it in immediate and long term um, and midterm. And so how do we collaborate? And there are other authorities that we work with amongst the federal family, but just wanted uh, today I more wanted to look at some of the programs that we have within USDA. If I could hand it over to my colleague Cardinal Suarez, uh, who's the California State Conservationist uh, for NRCS. And, and so he can talk about a more recent program we released, another flexibility to be able to look at opportunities that we can provide um, some relief and also some long-term programs to consider as, as we think about how long this drought will last. Carlos? Yes, uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, Gloria, for uh, the introduction and uh, talking about the different programs that we have under USDA. And as, uh, uh, as you indicated, uh, I'm Carlos Suarez, I'm the state conservationist for USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. NRCS is the agency within USDA, one of the largest agencies within USDA that been in existence for over 86 years. And our main focus has uh, been to protect the natural resources on private land working uh, individually uh, with our farmers, with our ranchers, with our forest land users, as well as our uh, tribal uh, brothers and sisters, uh, not only in California, but uh, nationwide. I have the honor to, uh, to be the state director and lead the efforts here in, in California. And I want to talk, as uh, uh, Gloria mentioned, talk about the programs that we have available and, and one that is in, in, in existence right now that is being piloted in this, not only in California, but also in Oregon, Colorado, and Arizona to address, uh, among other things, one of the main things is addressing drought and, and building drought resiliency among the, 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 uh, those four states. But before I, I go on, I, I do want to, to uh, kind of a, give you a quick picture of where we are as an agency and, and how, what are we doing uh, as an agency 
to protect the natural resources and actually to uh, provide that assistance and build the drought resiliency. I want to say a story, a short story about uh, seven years ago when I was in uh, Texas attending a meeting with uh, ranchers in Texas that, that were working on, on grazing lands. And at the time, they have come out of a uh, their own drought that they had uh, for several years. And we were in the middle of the previous drought, the 2012, uh, 2017 drought. And one of the questions I asked our far, uh, that rancher was, what would be your recommendation to ranchers or uh, farmers in California about the current drought that they're dealing with? And his response uh, actually helped me and help our team lay out the groundwork for how we're servicing them. His response was, don't worry about this one, prepare for the next one. And, and sure enough, since then, we have been preparing and building drought resiliency and the narrative has been drought resiliency, utilizing our conservation practices, utilizing our, as, I, as we call it, our conservation, our, our toolbox of conservation practices and programs to provide that assistance on a voluntary basis on private land to this, uh, to these uh, producers in our state. The programs that we have that right now, we, we currently have uh, uh, several, but um, ma the main one is the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, which is our main staple program. It's the one that provides financial assistance uh, to those farmers and especially it provides funding for historically underserved as well as Native American uh, uh, tribes to address those natural resource needs in, in the state and, and nationally. And here in California, we have done our focus on building that drought resiliency. We're utilizing those practices to focus on those priority areas in natural resources challenges that we have. It's not, ju not just uh, water conservation and water quality, but as many of you know, California no longer have a, a, a fire season. Fire season is year round. Therefore, we have adapted and utilized, uh, continue to use those programs and those practices to provide that assistance to those forest land uses to build forest health, to address uh, wildlife fires, uh, to build uh, wildfire resiliency, among with many other practices. So in the term of EQA, uh, under the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, and it was authorized, this uh, provision of uh, the EQA was authorized in 2018 under the Farm Bill of 2018, we have the conservation incentive co uh, contracts. Uh, the um, Secretary Vilsack, uh, as well as Deputy Undersecretary Montano and the Chief uh, Cosby, decided to utilize this program as a pilot starting this year for those four states, understanding the challenges that those four states are uh, going through with drought. And, um, and they have al allocated $41.7 million of funding through the conservation incentive contracts to assist, focus on those priority areas, um, those resource concerns, especially drought conditions, to assist those farmers, ranchers, and forest land users to implement conservation practices, implement incent utilizing as incentives to enhance conservation practices that they already either putting on their ground or they are new uh, to conservation or new to our programs and utilizing those opportunities to address, uh, to implement those practices throughout this funding. Uh, in California, we uh, are blessed to receive the majority of the funding, 22.7 million. And to this day, we have 647, 674 applicants that have applied for this, for this program. Most of the practices focus on uh, drought. In a, uh, and I'll, I'll mention a few of them. In uh, integrated water management, covered crops. We also building um, pollinator habitat. In addition, we are focusing on soil health practices which are very uh, uh, key to um, keeping uh, the, the moisture on the ground, keeping so the soils with uh, water capacity so that they can continue growing the, the crops in, in the state, especially in, in the situation where we have a lack of water or the lack of precipitation and the snow melt or the, uh, the snowpack from the Sierras is diminishing. We are at 50% of what we have nor in, in a normal year. Therefore, you have to utilize all the, the practices and all the resources available to keep that uh, water in, uh, in the ground. We also working on uh, making sure that, as I, I mentioned, utilizing CIC 
to provide uh, financial assistance to enhance prescribed grazing in, in the state. Uh, we are one of the large, largest states with uh, range in, in the nation with over 3 million acres of range. Uh, we also working on uh, utilizing CIC to improve drainage water management systems, as well as building um, uh, forest stand improvements and also um, building fire breaks. So we're very excited about this program, along with other programs that we utilize uh, in the state, like the RCPP, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, which is focusing on watershed or focusing on areas of, of concern throughout the state to provide funding on a one-to-one -one match with partners uh, to provide that financial and, uh, and technical assistance. I, I'd be remiss if I don't mention the work and the key work of partners in this in this effort. All, with all the funding that we're receiving, we receive about 120, 130 million dollars a year in conservation um, programs, uh, financial assistance programs. But all, with all that funding, we could not achieve what we are doing and how we're working together hand in hand with, without the excellent work of our partners. And to that extent, I, I want to mention the, the excellent partnership that we have with California Department of Food and Ag and her secretary, uh, Karen Ross, utilizes also their programs to manage and leverage our uh, leverage funding with our programs on other agencies to provide that assistance. Therefore, enhancing and increasing the financial assistance and technical assistance that we have, not only for water conservation, for air quality, but also for soil health practices. In addition, the Department of Conservation uh, were uh, that they uh, at the state level and the over 90, 90 uh, resource conservation districts that at the local level work with our 55 field offices in the state to put conservation on the ground at a local level and sometimes even at a regional level. And many others like the water cons uh, Department of Water Conservation and also the Department of Natural Resources, as well as other federal agencies. Uh, it was mentioned the Water Smart project, uh, work that uh, the Bureau of BOR is doing. And they're working, we are working with them partnering on, on Water Smart uh, to enhance irrigation systems that are delivered to uh, the water that is being delivered to local irrigators in the different respective um, irrigation districts in the state so that we build that efficiency and reduce the, the amount of water that is uh, may be lost. But also, we I want to say we are also partnering with academia, addressing uh, drought conditions and addressing the challenges and working with academia and other partners, other uh, non-government organizations to implement practices that are proven um, beneficial to the water conservation. Fortunately, we cannot create water. And many of you have heard and, um, and has been said that the situation, the water, especially groundwater, so one of the practices that we are implementing is being piloted by NRCS in California is groundwater recharge. By utilizing farm fields to hold water and into those farm fields and let that water sink into the groundwater, we are building our, uh, rebuilding our groundwater capacity in, in, at the farm level and the statewide level so that we can have that availability for, for our farmers to continue producing uh, the, our crops, continue producing fiber, food and fiber for not only for our great state, but also for the nation. So with that, I, um, I would like to, again, thank you for the opportunity to allow me to uh, share with you some of the things that we're doing in the state and uh, as part of USDA in supporting our sister agencies. With that, uh, Deputy Undersecretary, turn it back to you, ma'am. Thank you, Carlos. And I think um, our contact information is at the very end, but we recommend you going to farmers.gov uh, to be able to have various drought assistance, disaster assistance. We didn't talk about the other disaster programs and just making sure to connect with your local USDA service center and your crop insurance. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think, uh, Viva, I'll hand it, I guess it's back to you. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Assistant Secretary Trujillo, Deputy Secretary, Undersecretary, um, Gloria, I appreciate all of your comments, your remarks. Um, so let's go ahead and wrap this up. I would like to extend a huge thank you to everyone who shared their time, their energy and expertise with us today. All of the speakers, the panelists, 
our federal agency partners um, that, uh, that, that spoke with us today, and everyone who worked behind the scenes to make this webinar happen. Um, we will be providing a link to the resources discussed today on the webinar summary page at draft.gov slash webinars. And I guess I will just say that from all of us at NIDIS, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today. And that concludes today's webinar.